simple truth and nothing but the truth, please swear or affirm. Please have a seat. We start with our standing committee chair, um, oversight of the state police, uh, and then move to our members, uh, starting with Senator Stefano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sirs, for, for all of your service to Pennsylvania. I, uh, I'm proud to say uh, I'm a Pennsylvanian when I, I work with the state police, so I appreciate all that you do and the sacrifices your, your team puts forth every day to keep our uh, streets and our highways and, and, and uh, our cities safe. So again, thank you. Um, based on uh, the, your presented uh, testimony, I had a couple questions for you. Um, we've been hearing a lot of talk about the um, issue of municipalities and those that are, have coverage, local coverage, and those municipalities that don't. Um, based on the areas that you cover, um, do you think there, in your mind, uh, a population density where you feel a municipality should be considering local coverage? We, well, as we look around the state, we see varying uh, densities of population. Uh, you know, the state police is required to provide coverage to anyone who does not have uh, police coverage. Um, and, and where we have cases where there's part-time police coverage, we also fill that void as well. Uh, there are some areas where our, you know, our requests for services are probably higher than others. We probably do have those statistics available at some point in time to compare them to other areas. Uh, so, yes, I would say that there probably are some areas that uh, probably have a bit greater need for our services to, than others. Do you have any numbers in mind, though, of what population density? Because we do have some municipalities with just a, a few hundred people to municipalities with many thousands. Well, when you look at, uh, we'll use Hemfield Township because, you know, that's one of the biggest ones uh, across the state in the western part. Uh, you know, they have a great number of, amount of people there. Uh, we looked at some of our statistics uh, last year through our CAD system. Uh, there were over 15,000 CAD reports there. However, we did dwindle those down and took them to actual calls for service, and it came up to about 7,600 or so actual calls for service in that township. You know, and then we also added into, you know, our uh, uh, traffic enforcement, uh, which made added about 6,000 other uh, you know, contacts in that township. So, I mean, that's just one township, uh, just for an example. And, and the only reason I picked that one out is because it's probably one of the biggest ones in the state. That one's very close to me as well. Um, since you brought that up, um, that, there's a, another question that I had when we we're talking about uh, incident reports. I have a report that you submitted to this committee. I think it was uh, data from 2015. Incidents, for, uh, number of incidents per municipality. And in that report, um, you have it broken down as uh, areas without, um, well, the, those municipalities that you cover entirely, those with part-time municipal su uh, police support, and those with full-time. And they're all broken down, and I've been trying to analyze those numbers and try to figure out where that breakdown is. You know, we're talking about municipalities, where should they have local coverage, when shouldn't they have that? In that, in that breakdown, well, that was 2015. Do you, do you have any newer data than that? Uh, yes, we do. We, uh, currently, we stood up our uh, records management system, uh, and it started running a little bit past last year. So some of that data is not all, all together up to date, but we do have a printout uh, that could show you the amount of incidents per township uh, or borough. Uh, again, these would be raw numbers, and you would have to dwindle down and, you know, extrapolate some of the incidents out there, such as traffic violations or, or uh, Megan's Law walk-ins or those types of things. Uh, so we do have a more current report that would be available. Okay, then you just touched on my next question, which was that data that we just had an incident number. But in that number, um, whether the, there's local coverage or not, um, what does that number include? Cause does it include some of the other components of, of uh, traffic uh, incidences? Uh, I've got a municipality 
that has maybe 750 people but has a high, almost a one-for-one one incident number. But they have a major highway running through there intersecting. So is that crash data and included in that? Does it make it a fair representation of the actual requirements of that community based on their population? The current RMS system takes a number for every police contact, every incident that we do, every traffic stop, every DUI violation, everything. So uh, some of those are, are, are pretty benign. So again, we would have to extrapolate some of those numbers out to give you a true picture of actual calls for service. Uh, you may have a, uh, an interstate route or a turnpike route runs through your township. You're going to see those numbers that will boost those numbers up as well. So for a fair picture of actual police calls for service, we would need to extrapolate those out. That was my question. So that could include uh, turnpike incidences. Um, how about liquor control enforcement or casino incidents? Would all those be included as well? Yes, they would. There would also be a request for service for other agencies uh, as well in there. Okay, because it makes it difficult for that, us to analyze that data then without knowing the breakdown because those all three that I mentioned are already f uh, separate funding mechanisms. As right. we talk about how we're going to fund, um, when we talk about per capita fees and, and what, whatnot. That brings me to my next question. When we talk about our, um, uh, the presumed budget now in front of us that gives you about 100 million for the municipal services fees, um, if that wouldn't be able to get across the finish line, how would that impact your services? Well, it could impact on our cadet classes going forward. Uh, it would probably uh, impact on our current services, how we do things, uh, what is our police business model, uh, how would we respond to uh, citizens' requests for service. Uh, our assistance to local and federal law enforcement could be impacted. Uh, overtime costs would probably increase as well. And, uh, you know, I would have concern over officer safety uh, for uh, increased uh, health risks or uh, those types of uh, things as well. So uh, without that fee uh, or, or something to fill that void, uh, you know, it, it puts a big dent in our budget. Uh, we also have approximately about $70 million worth of uh, equipment and safety needs uh, that are not included in the budget at this point in time uh, that are ending near of life uh, and they have to be replaced. And unfortunately, some of those things come around every three to five years for replacement, ballistic helmets, vests, and those types of equipment needs. So that would be impacted as well. So we would have to take money from other areas of our budget to make sure that the public safety equipment was taken care of first. You mentioned the, uh, the cadet classes. You have, what, three cadet classes in place right now? Uh, we have three in place for this fiscal year. I'm trying to put one more through uh, in June. I'm trying to gather enough funds that we have available. Uh, and I hopefully I want to do that to bolster our complement to try and get up to our 4719 complement cap as close as I can. So well, how many more troopers do you anticipate those classes to put on the, uh, your roles? Well, we usually start with a class of about 120 cadets. Uh, our attrition rate sometimes takes us down between 95 and 100 graduation, uh, graduating cadets uh, as troopers. So right now we have uh, 341 vacancies in the department as of uh, February 16th, I believe. So this next uh, three classes could almost fill your vacancies? Yes, I believe so. Excellent. My next question along those same lines is, you know, uh, your, your um, I, I call it a bell curve, of the n number of uh, personnel that you have. How is that curve trending towards retirement? Do you expect large numbers in the next three, five, ten years that would affect the, the future cadet classes that we would need? Right now we have about uh, 1,058 members that have 20 years of service or more eligible for retirement at the 20-year mark. Uh, out of those uh, 1,058, 274 of them have more than 25 years of service. So uh, that doesn't factor in uh, military service or other state service. So, um, you know, we have no idea how many people decide to retire at any particular point in time. You know, that's a personal, a personal choice that they make. But uh, a lot of our people retire at the 25-year pin mark. So, uh, you know, we could see 274 people leave uh, within the next year or so. Okay, I was curious of the, the, uh, what, we were, what we're facing. 
Um, in terms of your barracks, too, as well, uh, are there any plans to close any barracks, or what would con uh, trigger a closing of a barrack? There are no uh, plans to close any barracks at this point in time, or any plans to consolidate any barracks at this time. Uh, we're always looking for efficiency in our operations as well. Uh, you know, if we have any discussions on any potential closings, uh, w it would require, you know, public input and public hearings. So, but we have no anticipated uh, closures of anything at this point in time. And that wouldn't be based on any type of uh, manpower shortage or anything. I would still try and staff our stations the best we could with the manpower that we had available. Uh, the last um, study that was done to look at your complement numbers, I believe, was 2001. Is that correct? Uh, 1999, 2000, somewhere around there, yes. And that's that number you quoted earlier, of 4,700? Uh, I think that one back then, it was a different number. Uh, so uh, after that study came out, I believe there was an increase of 370 members to the complement. Uh, with that uh, and factoring in the other uh, things that were, we, we pay for uh, some trooper expenses through uh, the, gaming in, the gaming industry, liquor control enforcement, uh, the Delaware River Bridge Authority, and uh, a couple other things. And those numbers equate with the total complement, brings us up to the 4719 number. Okay. Um, I did, um, as you're aware, uh, introduce a co-sponsorship memo. I think it's due time that we do another study to look at this complement number. I am assuming you would agree that it's, it's good time now is to have the study done again. I would agree, and we would support that and, uh, you know, assist you in any way in, uh, you know, making that study uh, uh, reality. Excellent. One last question for you. Um, in the previous hearings that I've been watching, um, we've been looking at the cost to provide local coverage, and, and there's been a lot of reluctance to talk about the, um, the cost per service model. Um, if we were going to go down that road, is starting to charge municipalities for the, the services that are provided. Um, are we looking to, to attempt to recover more costs for the work that the, like the lab does for CERT, deployments, uh, collision analysis, or other services you provide to the municipalities already? When, when the municipalities haven't, uh, have not chosen to equip them, themselves to handle those services? Uh, all of the services that we provide to local law enforcement or federal agencies uh, come uh, basically without cost to them. Uh, if we do a CERT deployment, which is very costly, uh, maybe the average might be $13,000 just for a basic call out. Uh, that's just not a protracted one or whatever. If we do that for local law enforcement, they do not get charged for those services. Uh, and I think probably in the past year we might have had uh, well over 100 of those uh, assisting local law enforcement as well. Uh, as far as lab user fees, we do put a lab user fee out there. Uh, first of all, most of our lab services, uh, when you look at them, uh, it's probably PSP one-third to uh, two-thirds for local law enforcement, what we do for those services. Uh, there is a lab user fee attached to that. Last year, uh, we billed for $17 million. Uh, we got a return back of about 9% or about $1.3 million. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, a lot of that is based on restitution. So when we uh, do our lab uh, fee service, uh, we send the stuff out to the local law enforcement. Uh, if there's no prosecution or no suspect or accused, uh, there is no way of reclaiming those things. Uh, however, if there is one, it usually goes to the county court. Uh, part of the restitution is made. However, keep in mind that, first of all, victims are gonna be compensated first if there's any restitution to be made. And then usually the county government gets involved in their restitution, whether for processing fees or probation and parole fees or other types of uh, uh, programs that the accused has to go through. Usually we're near the end of the line. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of turnaround for us to come back there. Uh, the fees haven't been increased probably in uh, 10 years or longer. Uh, you know, theoretically, if we raise the fees, you would think that we may get more money back. But that's not a given. If you're charging a lot more, you might get maybe about the same amount back. I don't know. We would have to see how that works out. Getting back to the question, if we would look at a uh, 
fee-for-services model, would you then have to consider charging for some of these services? Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, however, when you look at things such as our aviation assets, uh, because we're a law enforcement uh, entity, we cannot charge for those services. We would then be becoming more of a commercial uh, entity. Uh, so that's not a, that's not a, a, a practical way of uh, getting some money back through our aviation assets. And they are very costly as well. And we do a lot of support for local law enforcement with our aviation assets. So uh, that's one aspect where I don't know how you could get reimbursement back for. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That uh, concludes my questions at the moment. Thank you, uh, Senator Stavano. Um, Commissioner, there was a, a lot of conversation last hearing last year regarding uh, an alternative model for this, um, not a population-based model, but a cost of service-based model uh, in relation to the conversation about local police coverage. Was anything done with that? Internally? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. There was nothing put forward. There was no legislation. Who's developing the model now? Pardon? Who's developing the model now? Uh, this is developed by the uh, budget office in conjunction with the governor's office. Uh, <clears throat> and, and from input that the state police give to the budget office and the governor's office. Being here for a long time, the goal is raising money, right? That's the goal. The goal is raising money to offset costs. If there's an alternative put on the table that the, the many people on this panel have talked about, um, it would make sense for those who understand this and to have the information associated with it to offer up a different model, not just to come back with the same one. You know, th that these conversations that happen every year don't happen just to happen. They happen because there's an interest in actually accomplishing a goal, possibly. Now, the, what's been reconfigured is still the same population model, just, you know, repackaged. Um, until, I really believe, until those suggestions are taken seriously, because there's some real concern on this, on this panel that the population model doesn't track the actual services that are being provided in a way that's defendable, this, this conversation really doesn't go anywhere. And I think, frankly, I believe that what happened after, I don't think, it was not clear what was provided in this conversation last year. This, this conversation ended and um, there was no recognition of whether that was, whether anyone who was bringing it up was, was serious about it in the first place. So I really suggest and recommend when at least one or two or three members of this committee recommend an alternative to what you're offering that your department and the budget office take those recommendations seriously because we're left to the same place now than we were last year. We're no further along. So my recommendation is going to be until that happens, until that alternative is put on the table by those who can develop it. You know, we can help, but we don't have the data. No, we would work with you to develop it, but until that alternative is put on the table, I'm going to recommend to at least to our caucus that we don't take any of this seriously. So that's just my thoughts because it frustrates me that there is a there are people who bring these alternatives forward because they want to take it seriously, and it's just ignored, essentially. And, and chairman, and just to be clear, this this is a, something we view as a starting point. These discussions are ongoing. The starting point. This was put in the governor's proposal. A year ago. Yes, sir. It's not that hard. It doesn't take a year to come up with an alternative proposal. I know the legislative process is cumbersome and slow, but it doesn't take a year to come up with an alternative proposal. I believe that those who are listening to what's being provided here are just not taking the, the advice and counsel and the suggestions of this committee seriously. And we understand that, and we understand your concern, and, and it is an ongoing discussion. This isn't the final product. It served as a starting point for us. We're continuing to gather that data even as we speak here today. We have folks gathering additional data to look at some of those potential options, you know, a population-based model, et cetera. So that certainly is something that's on our radar, and we understand your perspective on that, and we will continue to the only way we can actually possibly take it more seriously is of all, because this is not an easy issue. And you guys know that, that this is, if we advance something like this, there's gonna be a lot of people who are not gonna be happy. So there's gotta have to be a real, 
a real thorough, uh, consider all options scenario here before it can even be viable at all. All right, so I appreciate it. Senator Morton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today and, and for the job that you do to try to keep our Commonwealth safe. Um, I'll start off saying, though, this kind of feels like Groundhog Day, <laughs> where we, uh, we, I think this is my third straight uh, appropriations budgets process that I've been through. Um, this issue continually comes up and then out. The narrative out in the public tends to be not really reflective of what's going on. But I'll say first and foremost, um, I don't believe it's driven by you guys, these, the, the proposals and where the fees were being applied to. Um, but I think what's important for the public to know when we have these discussions is exactly, I don't think anyone truly understands what you all do for the entire commonwealth of this state. Um, you know, I had uh, reports that I'd shared with my colleagues just recently on your 2015 data. Um, Right off the bat, 45% of your incidents, and I will say there's a notation in here that does not include RMS final call type TS traffic stop in these numbers, so that's clear because everyone says, oh, it's just highway pullovers. These numbers do not. But 45% of the incidents that PSP was involved with, and it can be a whole wide array of things, happened in municipalities that have full-time local police. Um, I just got 2018 data from you this morning, and I really appreciate that, so we can update uh, all the members as well. Um, but some of the trends hold true. Uh, the number one place, the most incidents and resources that you had spent in any municipality in this Commonwealth was in the city of Philadelphia. And that number for 2018 that I have right here is 30,655. Does that sound about correct? Um, Westmoreland is also up there, as someone had men uh, mentioned earlier. But three out of the top five, I haven't had a chance to look at the entire thing, but I know in the last data, three out of the top five utilizing municipalities in this Commonwealth were municipalities that utilized you were municipalities that had their own local police force. Now, if we sit that aside to responding to incidents, I think it's no secret the specialty teams that you all uh, operate with drugs, uh, error-related services that you provide, lab services, which are so critical, and we're very grateful, uh, especially when you guys expedite things for some pretty serious things that occur on the local level. Um, can you go into a little bit about what some of the services are that the state police provide that really, there is no, we can put aside this argument about who has local and who doesn't, but the things that you all do on behalf of justice and protecting the community that benefits all of Pennsylvanians. Richard, do you want to take that? Well, we'll start out with the teams because you mentioned that. We, we operate our Bureau of Emergency and Special Operations. Could I, I'm could sorry. we ask you to uh, put your mic on? Push, there's a button there. Button, there you go. There you go. <laughs> sorry, I thought I had it on. Uh, I'll start out with uh, our Bureau of Emergency and Special Operations because we touched on that a little bit. Uh, that has several components to it, one being the Special Emergency Response Team, as the Colonel mentioned before, just looking at an average call out for an incident, say a barricaded gunman or a high risk warrant service. Right away, you're talking on average about thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars to commit to that incident. Next, we would get into aviation. They're probably the second most visible, if you will. Uh, let me ju just jump back to the CERT team for, for just a quick reference here. 177 activations last year. In the barricaded situations, 67 of those, only 92 of those were in our primary areas of jurisdiction. The rest of those sir, took place in another law enforcement entity's coverage area, 85 in total. Uh, next, as I said, uh, aviation. Aviation is, a, is an expensive proposition. There, there's no other way to get around it. We operate both fixed wings and rotor. The section last year, the total number of requests was 1,614. And we also fly in support of non-law enforcement entities. We, we just flew a mission, for example, for DEP to assist in them. Again, because of the service provided, that's on the state police. There's no way to recover that funding. We operate HIDES, which is, deals with explosives. They get deployed on a very regular basis. And primarily in other areas of jurisdiction that are not ours. Total number of requests from them last year in 2018 was 362, sir. 
And that could be anything from blasting caps to an improvised device to a found ordinance. We also operate a tactical mounted unit. Yes. We had lots of requests for that last year, 232 to be exact. More than half of those were to assist lo other law enforcement entities, either in a demonstration type program or a large scale event such as the PSU games were done at the Philadelphia Eagles or some other large venue gathering of people. Uh, again, another very expensive operation that we do not get funded for. Other than that, we would have to look at our support just in whole, right from the field. For example, the, the major incidents, if you will, a homicide, some other violent crime against a person, something that is very labor intensive and hours dedicated to, uh, and I mean no disrespect by this, but a lot of the departments are small departments. They don't have the ability to continue that type of long-term investigation, and we wind up adopting them, or at least assisting them on it. Just out in the field, for example, the number of homicide investigations last year in other areas was 20. Again, long-term labor-intensive investigations, especially when you look at not only the investigation itself, but when it extends out into the prosecution of the offense, sir. Well, I pre appreciate that information. It's important people know all the things that you do and, and, and to know that where you stage your resources is ent entirely across this Commonwealth. In, in, in urban areas that have police departments already, you can find state police resources that are there as well, just as well as you can find troops that are located in rural areas, too. Um, we've had a great relationship with the state police in, in my county. I think about a third of our land mass is covered by the state police. Um, they, they work hand in hand. They help each other where, where appropriate in some pretty important situations. Um, but then there's also times, too, where people, if they want more intensive enforcement of local ordinances, I know I'll just name one, Strasburg Township in Lancaster County, um, but the state police felt that that's something they could not do in terms of enforcing some of those local ordinances. What did they do? They, they turned around and contracted out with Strasburg Borough on a part-time basis to do those things. So you guys all tend to work together. Um, so I think what people's perception is on this issue isn't always reality. I, I, I personally believe, just to kind of piggyback on what Senator uh, Brown had talked about and what we got into in hearings last time, I personally don't think the solution to this issue is going to come from the, uh, the way we're looking at it now in terms of from a funding side. I think a lot of it's due to the, we have a lot of overlap in law enforcement. I don't think anyone denies that in Pennsylvania with the number of forces we have, county sheriff departments, then constables and detectives, and the, the list goes on and on. Then until we start looking at it from the base up, uh, I think some of the solutions that we've heard over the last three, three straight budget cycles I can think are pretty much a problem looking for a solution uh, than actually being the solution. Um, so I see I'm running out of time right now, but um, I appreciate the work that you do. I, uh, I kind of feel bad that you guys get put in the middle of these funding conversations because I know deep down you guys just want to do your job in order to keep the Commonwealth safe. Uh, but uh, hopefully the administration and budget will reach out to us and follow up on some of the things that we discussed last year in hearings and trying to lay out a, ground, a groundwork to come to a solution that's grounded in reality in terms of the statistics and that works best for all of Pennsylvania. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Martin. Uh, Senator Lego Hall is followed by Senator Street. Good afternoon. I echo the comments of my colleagues in thanking you for your service to the Commonwealth. Uh, last year, uh, Senator Scarnati and Senator Corman of our caucus tasked uh, myself and Senator Mike Regan uh, in, to address school safety issues. And given uh, Senator Regan's background as a former U.S. Marshal, given my background as a former Assistant District Attorney, uh, we you know, had a lot of conversations and, and talked to a lot of people. And subsequently, uh, we were able to pass in a short amount of time a bipartisan effort which really was able to allocate which i'm sure you're aware uh, significant school funding uh, in that past budget as a part of that act 44 requirement was to require pennsylvania state police to increase the number of troopers that are part of your risk and vulnerability assessment teams and by march 
31st of this year, the state police needs to have established three risk and vulnerability assessment teams to operate within the three regions geographically designated uh, in consultation with the committee. And each of those, uh, each risk and vulnerability assessment team, as I'm sure you're aware, should be comprised of no less than three troopers. My question is, can you provide an update on where you were at with regard to developing those teams and as a follow-up, how many risk and vulnerability assessments for schools did RVAT complete in the last year? Maybe answer that question first. How many assessments were done in the last year and then also provide an update on where you're at in lieu of the looming March uh, 31st deadline? Okay, in 2018, we conducted 104 assessments, so approximately 85 of those were schools alone. Uh, right now, our backlog uh, for schools is uh, 120 for K-12, to uh, private school K-12, to we have a 60 assessment backlog, higher education, we have a 16 assessment backlog, and the total education backlog comes to 198 assessments. Uh, we're in the process of completing our final RVAT member being selected. Uh, we will have uh, three teams across the state with each three members in each team. Uh, so that is uh, coming to fruition. There is a training curve for them, unfortunately. They have to go for a training uh, down, I believe it's in uh, Glencoe, Georgia, for I think it's about a two-week period. Then there is a learning curve where you have to do so much uh, curriculum uh, and training uh, on your own while doing these as well. So until we get fully stood up, you know, there will be a little backlog there as well, but uh, we're on track to be moving forward with those assessments and having the personnel in place for them. And you don't anticipate any issues going forward in subsequent years here? Uh, I can only see that we're going to have a, a need for more RVAT assessments. Uh, I, I know through the uh, school safety committee there, we've, we're coming up with uh, uh, private entities to be able to weigh in and do the, some of those as well if, uh, you know, the school just w wish to contract for those services. You indicate in your materials that there are seven crime labs operating throughout the Commonwealth. And I believe I asked this question last year and, and just dealing with past experience. Can you speak to the burden that those labs have as far as turnaround time. I know having prosecuted drug cases or homicides, the amount of time that it takes certain, not so much on the homicide end, but more so on drug identification, uh, submitting to labs can be some backlog. And can you talk to how those labs are tasked? Uh, we'll talk about the DNA backlog for, uh, to start with. Uh, you know, forensic evidence requiring DNA has to go through a two-step process. It has to go to the serology section first and then processed by the DNA section. Uh, in 2018, the serology section backlog decreased from uh, 1,544 cases down to 748 cases. So this is a 51% 51 51 backlog reduction. Uh, in 2018, the DNA section backlog decreased from 813 cases to 592 cases. Uh, this is a 27% reduction in backlog. Uh, and combined, it's a 17% decrease in turnaround time. Uh, emergency priority cases can be done in two to four days, and we do those uh, when necessary for particular uh, cases of high profile or homicides when necessary. Uh, I'll ask uh, Major Hope to uh, add some additional information on potential backlogs or where we're at, including the number of cases that are out there right now. Senator, just to give you an idea of what the, the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Labs have done in the last year, uh, all total 4,000, excuse me, 40,000, 49 cases were submitted to uh, our labs across the Commonwealth. Uh, the lab team was successful in completing over 41,000 cases. That included some of the cases that were in the backlog. At the end of the year, the, at the end of the calendar year, we were 7,424 cases behind in our backlog. Now that includes all disciplines. That includes the APHIS examinations, the firearms and tool marks, the ballistic cases. Uh, as you heard the Colonel mention, the, the DNA backlog, the serology backlog. Um, but uh, to, to your point, uh, the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab personnel 
uh, under the direction of uh, Major Turner Childs have been doing a phenomenal job in keeping up not only with uh, the case log or the, the, the cases that are being brought to them, which are increasing significantly, but also in clearing up the backlog. Uh, as you heard the Colonel mention, uh, the, the turnaround day or turnaround rate uh, for serology and DNA decreased from 258 days down to 208 days. That includes both disciplines. Uh, and it, again, as he pointed out, uh, in emergency cases, we have the ability to bump cases to a, a priority level and get those turned around much more quickly. Um, with regard to Senator uh, DeStefano's question earlier, uh, this is just one example of many where the Pennsylvania State Police support our local uh, uh, departments across the Commonwealth uh, with regard to their investigations that, that uh, require this level of expertise and in, to further their investigations. I'd like to add uh, one thing too as well. Uh, you know, we, we were slated to have our new DNA laboratory up and running by the end of uh, 2019. However, because of construction setbacks uh, based on land and some other water runoff issues, uh, we don't look like we're not going to have their building up and complete until June of 2021. Uh, with that said, the DNA uh, Legislation Act uh, 147 of 2018, uh, as you know, that requires us now to start uh, looking at people with felony offenses and misdemeanor one and two offenses. Uh, without that lab being stood up, uh, we anticipate a potential problem uh, of anywhere of increasing from 15,000 to up to 55,000 samples per year. Uh, without that lab being stood up and not the additional uh, personnel to be able to staff it, um, you know, we're looking at a potential cost of another $4.8 million added cost to our uh, DNA analysis. Okay. Thank you. If I could add, and it kind of yeah. speaks to the APHIS lab, and it also speaks to what Senator Martin had spoke about. The, the services that we provide for other entities, for local policing, you know, Major Degnan spoke about the operational aspect, the helicopters, and those things that are, are visible. <laughs> but keep in mind, in terms of, of laboratory services and, and infrastructure, we maintain the AFA system, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System for the entire Commonwealth. When the Colonel spoke of an additional $70 million in needs, one of those needs is six to $8 million to refresh and replace the APHIS infrastructure, for which we had a vulnerability assessment done by the vendor, and, and it's nearing end of life. The county central booking centers, everyone who uses LiveScan depends upon that APHIS infrastructure. Now, Act 81 booking centers charge a fee to support the local booking centers, but none of that comes to PSP to support the APHIS infrastructure. Okay, I don't want to cut you. i got to ask one more question. I see my time blinking. Uh, I appreciate your answers. One quick question. I had introduced legislation dealing with rape kit backlogs, and there was a requirement of the state police to in, introduce uh, the biennial, a biannual report, which was due in December to the Department of Health. Was that submitted, and were there any issues with the submission of that uh, dealing with the rape kit backlog? Senator, as recently as this morning, the information that we've been able to compile thus far has been provided to the Department of Health. Um, the, uh, it, while we're on the, uh, the topic of the uh, sexual assault uh, kits, uh, last year the, the department uh, received 1,028. Uh, the kits completed were 1,163. Once again, that number exceeds the number that we brought in because we've been diminishing the backlog of those cases. At the end of the calendar year, we had remaining uh, 390 uh, cases in our possession. Uh, with regard to the six-month requirement of, of the turnaround time, we've been meeting that goal at 160 days. So we've been successfully been uh, been very successful in turning those cases uh, around in, in uh, the required uh, time period. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Street, Father Senator Lachlan. Uh, First, I, I too would like to join my colleagues in thanking you for your service. Uh, when folks in, are engaged in law enforcement and literally put your lives on the line for Pennsylvanians, we should all be appreciative of the service you provide. Moreover, I want to echo comments about how we know that you all would prefer not to be in the middle of our budget discussions, um, but it is an, a necessary part of the process. In the way of background for some of my colleagues, because there was some suggestion around uh, where services are provided and the scope and of amount of services. And I think the number was put out about 30,000 responses in the city of Philadelphia. 
um, in Philadelphia for, for the purpose of colleagues understanding this. There are about 7,000 police officers, Philadelphia police officers. There, that doesn't include school police, university police at Temple, Penn, and other institutions. I think we have about nine institutions that have school police, housing authority police, SEPTA police, and the Philadelphia sheriffs, totaling about eight to 9,000 sworn officers conservatively, cl possibly close to 10,000 sworn officers in the city of Philadelphia. And each of those officers has responds to about 10, 10, 10 you know, responses a day, which would be about one, a little bit more than one an hour, that would be somewhere between 90 and 100,000 a day, which would mean that 30,000 responses represents roughly one third of one day's policing in the city of Phil in the city and county of Philadelphia. So when you have 1.6 million people in your county, it's easy to use raw numbers and make it sound like there's a lot of activity. That being said, uh, whenever you're called on, we know you're there. Um, but I don't want to give some dispers uh, we don't I don't want to create misconceptions about the level of policing that is done and who's doing it. Um, uh, and I don't really need you to respond to that. This is just statistical information because it was put out there and I needed to, I needed, co I needed colleagues to have some context for what's going on. But one third, uh, uh, 30,000 responses in a year rough, is roughly one third of one day's policing in the city of Philadelphia. So um, that being said, there have been trends, what I do wanna ask you about, there have been trends uh, related to increased ethnic intimidation. We saw what happened in the Tree of Life um, in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm, I'm interested in how are crimes of ethnic intimidation reported, uh, uh, consistent with the Uniform Crime Reporting System. And too often, um, we have crimes that may be considered ethnic intimidation that could be reported as, that, that might be characterized as routine vandalism. Is there a way to capture some of that information um, because we really do need to get a sense of what's going on so that we can get out front of uh, what seem to be very disturbing trends in the Commonwealth, which are not inconsistent with what's going on throughout the rest of this country. Yes, there are a couple, uh, a few points there. So the ethnic intimidation, it's a sentence, or it's an enhancement, uh, essentially, um, we have a Heritage Affairs unit. Uh, we task our Heritage Affairs officer with a number of different things. We're actually in the process of expanding uh, that unit and looking for ways to leverage the, the capacity of the folks in Heritage Affairs. But we've tasked them essentially with monitoring any sorts of incidents where uh, there may be racial tension. Uh, it doesn't have to even rise to the level of a crime. Uh, it, it, it can be simply an incident that comes to our knowledge uh, through whatever conduit, it may be open source news reporting, it may be our electronic daily command report. There are a whole host of ways we get that information. And our Heritage Affairs unit, our Heritage Affairs office then reaches out to those local communities where that tension appears to occur or reaches out to the local agency who may be involved in an investigation to provide investigative support and guidance. What we find sometimes is there's potentially a misunderstanding um, of the elements of, of some of the offenses and what actually qualifies and what is defined as ethnic intimidation, for example. So our Heritage Affairs Office, as we continue to grow that and, and attempt to leverage their capacities, uh, for example, we responded to the Tree of Life to support the efforts there and worked in concert with the FBI's units in the Tree of Life shooting to interact with the Jewish community. Uh, it's a learning experience for us as well, because what you learn from those sorts of responses is uh, some of the intricacies in dealing with the, the various communities and how to handle incidents in these communities with sensitivity. So that's primarily an element and a responsibility of our Heritage Affairs Office. Well, I want to thank you, and I just want for members to note, you know, Senator Brown and I have offered legislation about protecting sacred spaces. I think it's important that this is that we move forward with being able to uh, look at these issues and some of the lower level crimes that are ca currently characterized as vandalism uh, in a way we capture it and make sure that you all can track the appropriate data and that we can address these things appropriately. And I thank Senator Brown for working with me on this and making sure that we do this in a bipartisan way. Thank you, Senator Street. Senator Lachlan, followed by Senator Vogel. Um, Commissioner, thank you for being here today. I appreciate your service to this state. Uh, I have a few questions uh, pertaining to the state police fee uh, 
insofar as uh, the reason, in my opinion, the reason it was proposed in the first place uh, is just to raise funds. Uh, I don't think anybody really would disagree with that, but if, if you do, you can tell me that. Uh, uh, how, how much additional overtime do you uh, anticipate for troopers in the coming year? Given, I mean, given the fact that we're graduating cadet classes now, again. I think that's pretty hard to predict it based on the circumstances of what's going on out there. Um, the, the, you know, we were given an increase in our budget uh, allotment probably of about $33 million. And uh, basically that is just to keep up with benefits and uh, contractual salary increases. Uh, so that increase alone uh, is only taken care of for our basic uh, uh, salary and benefits. As far as how much overtime we anticipate that would we need in the future, it's hard to say. We probably have some uh, statistics uh, in the past on overtime. Uh, I don't know if we can project that out. Compliment? Well, I don't uh, know if we have yeah, that available let, right now. We'll just we'll move on. Uh, you know, I, I come from a private sector background, uh, and. And in a, our workforce, we always had to balance uh, whether we paid overtime or if we hired, hired another troop. Or, not, or for, for you guys, it would be a trooper. For me, it would have been a carpenter. But uh, uh, what, what do you feel is the cutoff point uh, where, it's, where it's just cheaper to hire a new uh, officer versus pay overtime? Do you have that calculation somewhere? I do not, but we probably couldn't calculate one of those up for you. I, I would appreciate that. I'm always concerned with the compliment. Uh, I know there's a proposal out there to do a compliment study again, and uh, you know we welcome that yeah. uh, to see how much overtime is being utilized versus is it cheaper to hire a new hire and uh, go yeah. from the ground up. Well, so. yeah, I'm I'm very interested in that because you know as you're aware, there's some legacy costs with with each person that you hire as well. So I'd like to see those calculations if you can produce those for me, uh, and then. Uh, I, I have a, uh, a, a question that kind of ties into that that has to do with the pensions. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I spoke to Eugene D. Pasquale, uh, and he made me aware uh, of what's known as overtime spiking. And I, I, I guess I'm just asking you, uh, as a compromise, uh, would the state police feel that uh, a pension cap at 100% of full salary would be a reasonable point because I've heard horror stories of guys that are, are making like one and a half times their salary as a retired officer. Could you speak to that, please? Well, we think that would have to be uh, some issues to deal with the collective bargaining agreements with the union. Uh, there are contractual uh, things that have to be worked out if someone wanted to go down that road at this point in time. Uh, I know that the new hires now, there was a, there was a cap on uh, uh, overtime concerning voluntary overtime versus mandatory overtime. So that is already in play. Okay. Thank you. I, that's all I have today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lock and Senator Vogel, followed by Senator Allman. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I guess my first question revolves around, uh, Commander, could you uh, walk us through the process of from the day a, a cadet gets hired till the day they become an officer in a patrol car on a turnpike? How long does that time frame take and what all, entail, what all entails in that process, I guess? Could you uh, take a minute and walk us through that process? I'm just curious as to how that all... Yes, sir. So the, our, the, the hiring process it in, it entails um, originally a uh, written test, which we're, we're very excited. In the past, we, we, give the, we had given the test in, in two-week blocks. Essentially, we had opened the testing period. We've recently engaged with the State Civil Service Commission to do open, open testing. That's actually um, one of our diversity initiatives, such that the testing process would be open for a full six months. And, and it's at will testing. You can schedule and go in at any time versus a two week uh, window. Once we get a list from that test and we have an outside vendor look at the test and, and it's designed such that we ensure uh, that we limit any adverse impact and, and that, that the test is, is lawful and the results um, are statistically valid, we then move on to an oral interview stage. After the oral interview, the results are combined and then there's a process wherein 
uh, a background investigation would be conducted. There's a physical readiness test. There's medical and psychological exams. And that all occurs prior to the day you walk in the academy. Um, we have great success. Uh, law enforcement has, has difficulty right now, generally, recruiting qualified candidates. We're actually pretty fortunate in the number of, of candidates that, that we have coming to the door. We would hope that's because of our, our reputation and our legacy. In the last three years, we've had 35,000 applicants, um, and fully 40% of those are, are uh, diverse candidates when we look at the numbers overall. At that point, then, the academy training starts, and, and it's a residence academy. So cadets appear. Normally, they're there for two weeks at a time with every other weekend off. Um, there are, are duties and additional training sometimes occurs at night because the unique nature of what we do, um, for example, shooting. There's night shooting. We do driving at night, all in, in, in uh, the name of officer safety and risk mitigation. The academy then lasts, uh, it will be 28 weeks actually. Uh, MOPEC standards for municipal police officers are 990 hours of curricula. Uh, we actually exceed that slightly, although our time is compressed because it's a residence academy. So some of the Community College Act 120 programs may be uh, 8 or 10, 12 or 18 months. We're actually 28 weeks because it's, it's on a compressed schedule and it is a residence academy. And then at that point, a cadet um, is promoted, graduates, uh, becomes a trooper and serves a probationary period of 18 months from the uh, time the trooper or the cadet enters the academy. So during their probation period, they ride with another officer or they just yes. put on other duties? They ride with another officer during that 18 month yeah, it's, period? It's, it's, a, it's a trooper. Uh, they're promoted to the rank of trooper, um, but they're, on, they're essentially doing 60 days in a field training capacity. And then there's some additional probationary time where we evaluate their performance. Uh, on a more rigorous uh, basis to ensure that they're meeting the standards that we demand. Okay, next question, I guess, is you uh, did a, a study, I guess, the last year or so on, on body cameras and things like that. Uh, could you give us how results of how that worked out? And there has been talk of you possibly uh, looking to do that statewide, I guess. Senator, we, uh, we concluded at the end of the uh, calendar year a six-month-long study uh, on body cams where we deployed 30 devices uh, to troopers uh, assigned to three of our stations at Uniontown, Avondale, and at uh, Troop T Somerset out on the Turnpike. Uh, those cameras, those devices were purchased with a federal grant, um, not for the purpose of buying body cams, but for the purpose of instituting a policy which had to be in place uh, prior to. Uh, that policy was submitted into the, uh, uh, to the uh, grant uh, folks who awarded us the, the, the funding. Uh, and at the conclusion of the uh, six-month period, uh, we've gotten very favorable reviews uh, of, the, uh, of the body cam program. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Police are looking at carrying that program forward into the future, uh, but there's a price tag associated with that, uh, and it's a hefty price tag. Uh, Right now, uh, we're faced with uh, replacing some of the, uh, uh, the, the components with, that are within our patrol vehicles. Our MVRs are at end of life. Our mobile office computers are at end of life. Uh, we are in the, per in the process now of putting together an RFP uh, that should be released within the next several weeks uh, to solicit bids from, from uh, the, the vendor community uh, to replace those components within the, the cockpit of that vehicle. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, the, uh, everyone seated here at this table uh, can attest through time uh, how that, that patrol vehicle has changed from the time we first came on the job. Today it looks like something out of, the, uh, uh, out of a NASA um, program. Uh, but to that end, all of that technology comes with a significant price. Uh, but the, 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 the benefit uh, of, of our MVR program, and that's where we have the, the most um, data and experience that, that through time to look uh, at what value that technology has brought to the agency overall uh, has been uh, really priceless. Uh, it's been not only from an evidentiary standpoint, but from also from a uh, transparency standpoint for uh, uh, the ability to uh, you know, record interactions at roadside with, with the public. Uh, and that, uh, that technology has, has proven itself to be uh, very, uh, again, priceless to the agency. Thank I would just like to oh, add, sure. uh, talk about the cost component for all of these uh, uh, different programs. 
uh, the mobile video recorders and the mobile office, uh, we feel the need that they all need to be combined with the body camera program in one seamless thing called an ecosystem, and that's where we're proposing we're going with this. Unfortunately, the cost is very hefty. Uh, you know, we, we set aside $6 million last year in our budget for the program. However, we haven't utilized that funding at this point in time uh, because of just coming out of the pilot program and moving forward. But our anticipated cost for the first year would be about $19.7 million. Uh, the second year would probably be about $19.8 million. Years uh, 3 to 10 would be about $2.7 million each. So for, to stand up the program for the first five years would probably cost us $47.7 million. Now that doesn't even include any redaction uh, or, or those types of things, but we don't see that being a big cost uh, extra at this point in time because uh, since we put the program out, uh, we only had, uh, there were 50 re 53 requests for audio video recordings and none of them were really for the body cam program. So if that's any type of gauge of what we might see, uh, we don't see a big, push for redaction and the release of the information. Uh, there was one body cam footage us utilized in one uh, criminal investigation uh, so far that I'm aware of. Uh, but again, that five-year cost outlay is probably going to be about $47.7 uh, million. And uh, you know, we really have to look at, is that cost worth uh, what we would gain from it? So uh, it's a big ticket item. So. No, thank you very much, and I appreciate this. And we'll probably have this conversation going forward. So I. Thank you very much for your time today, gentlemen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Vogel. Senator Allman, followed by Senator Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to ask a couple questions about the uh, statewide radio, uh, if I could. Uh, last session, I had the uh, privilege of chairing the Communications and Technology Committee and worked with uh, Senator Volokovich to hold um, a few hearings on this topic and uh, to hear an update from the state police with regards to the transition to the statewide public radio system. So I'd just like to give you an opportunity to provide this committee with an update. Uh, where we stand is the upgrade sta staying within budget. What has been the total cost of the upgrade to, to this point? Senator, I'd be happy to respond to that question. Um, you're going to hear two words here that uh, probably are not heard too often uh, in state government, uh, on schedule and on budget. Uh, under the uh, direction of Major Diane Stackhouse, Bob Barnum and her team, uh, they have been aggressively rolling out the, the statewide P25 radio system across the Commonwealth. To date, we've got 34 counties uh, that, are, that are in the coverage area. That includes seven PSP troops. Um, the vendor that's uh, a part of this $44 million contract um, has been uh, very responsive to any issues with regard to uh, technical issues that have, have cropped up within the, um, with the program, and they've been very minimal. Uh, this year, uh, we are requesting for the StarNet budget approximately $50 million uh, to fund that project and to keep it moving forward and to keep it on track. Uh, the, the project pays huge benefits in public safety uh, from the standpoint of interoperability. Uh, this is something that's been lacking across the Commonwealth for, uh, for, for way too long. Uh, once this radio program is fully deployed and implemented, uh, this will allow our troopers to communicate uh, across the entire Commonwealth and with other agencies to include our federal partners who have jumped on board uh, to include the ATF, uh, the DEA, and the United States Marshal Service. Uh, both, uh, all three of those agencies are uh, in, involved with our P25 program. Um, in addition to, not only to the functionality that this P25 radio system uh, will provide to, to, our, to our troopers, uh, who are, are the biggest consumers uh, of the system currently, um, the, the counties, the, the local 911 centers are also uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to leverage the towers that, uh, uh, that we'll be utilizing uh, for this system. Uh, there's cost savings that, uh, for the counties uh, to now get on some of these towers and erect their, their antennas and so forth uh, to, to provide communications to the, uh, the local police departments that they're serving. Uh, from a cost savings perspective, uh, once the P25 is fully deployed and that uh, is expected to be completed uh, mid-year of uh, 2021, uh, we th will then decommission our current 800 uh, megahertz radio system. Uh, and also our current VHF legacy system. Uh, and, and the reason that I bring that to your attention is that both of those systems that are currently in place um, 
w w upon their decommissioning, we stand to see some uh, 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 cost reduction with regard to leases. Uh, the number of towers, for instance, with the 800 uh, uh, megahertz system, we, we currently deploy approximately 1,100 towers across the Commonwealth. That will be reduced down upon the completion of the uh, P25 to 120 towers. So the sites that we need to maintain, all the utility costs that, that, that we, we have to bear because of, uh, to, to maintain those services uh, to all of those facilities will, will again be reduced. So we're looking for cost savings there uh, as we move the, for, uh, the program forward. Thank you very much for that update. And I, I will say that uh, certainly my uh, perception on the outside has been that this project took a significant favorable turn under the uh, direction of Major Stackhouse and, and certainly want to commend uh, the work that, uh, that she and, and her team have done. Uh, and, and while I want to be certainly forward leaning and forward thinking, I know there are many members that have had some concern with uh, the past 20 years and, and, uh, and the history of this project. And I know during the, the appropriations hearings last year in both the House and the Senate, there were a number of members inquiring as to whether there was criminal conduct during the procurement process of the radio system during the last 20 years. At that time, Major Stackhouse testified that the state police had initiated an audit through the Office of Budget and has been discussing all civil remedies with PSP's chief counsel. Are you able to provide any, uh, any update on that? Has an audit, in fact, been completed? Uh, and can you share any of the results of that audit with, uh, with the committee? I believe the audit has been completed, Senator. Uh, I believe there has been a resolution. Uh, however, I, I, I'm not uh, certain at this point whether I'm, I'm privy to speak of that, uh, to that, to that issue uh, because of the, uh, the legal uh, aspect of that. Okay, thank you. Any information that you are able to, uh, to provide by way of follow-up I think would be, be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Allman, Senator Killian, followed by Senator Phillips Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm over here. Welcome, and thank you for what you do. Uh, I, and I'll be brief. All my questions I had concerning about the fee and concerns have been addressed. But a, a question on the new barracks in Middletown, Delaware County, it happens to be where I live, on the old Franklin Mint site. Yeah, are they coming along as far as putting a new building a new barracks there? My understanding is the township last year gave a, last week gave approval, and that a developer was building it that you were going to lease it back. Sir, are you referring to the uh, the Lima Lab or the uh, Skipback yeah, Barracks? Yeah. The, the Lima Lab? No, the Media Barracks on Route 1 by the Granite Run Mall. Yes. Um, my understanding is that, that the, uh, the bid um, is progressing, uh, but I can certainly provide you with some additional details uh, at the conclusion of the meeting. Okay. I'm just curious. I've been in your facility there, and it's... It needs to be replaced, and it's not your fault it has been replaced, but it needs to be replaced, and I am sure the troopers are looking forward to a, a nicer home uh, than what they currently have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cullian, Senator Phillips, Hill, followed by Senator Mench. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Majors, thank you for being here today. Really appreciate it. Um, wanted to follow up on the line of questioning that Senator Ament began with you. And, and just so that I fully understand, um, are all of the towers from Open Sky System being utilized with this new P25 system? Um, you referenced that we had 1,100 towers. We're going down to 120 towers. Is that correct? The, the, the benefit to the Commonwealth from the previous radio system, Senator, um, first and foremost, is it, uh, we, we have a, uh, a microwave system in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that is second to none anywhere in the country, um, which is a benefit of the, of the uh, 800 megahertz system that is currently deployed. Uh, I believe there are, will be 173 towers that will remain um, from the uh, open sky network. Uh, my understanding is that approximately 450 of the towers in, in uh, again, everything is, is in the definition when, when you speak to the tower. Many of the uh, sites that I'm referencing here, those 450, are simply nothing more than a phone pole 
uh, with a, an antenna attached to, to the top of that that have been uh, introduced into the system to boost coverage in, within a specific geographic area. Um, so they're not the actual structural, stru large structural towers that you think of, uh, you know, that uh, we have some of those, but not all of those are of that, uh, that type or design. So currently then, um, are those towers owned by the Commonwealth that we're no longer going to be using, whether it's a, a large metal structure or whether it's a pole with an antenna? Those are owned or those are leased by the state police? Both, ma'am. Both. We, Both. We have some that are, that are, are on Commonwealth uh, property, such as uh, land that's owned by DCNR and others that, that are uh, on property that we, uh, we pay a lease for. Okay. So um, I'm sure, as you probably know, one of the issues that I've worked fairly diligently on um, over the past several years with Representative Pam Snyder has been increasing statewide access to high-speed internet. You know how valuable communications are for you. Um, they're also important for um, other emergency responders and, and, and people in general. Um, recently, there was a study done by the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, and it says that approximately 11 million Pennsylvanians lack access to high-speed internet. So we introduced a uh, Representative Snyder and I introduced a piece of legislation last year that would require DGS to inventory all State Department, agency, commission, institution-owned assets um, to assist in the provisioning of high-speed internet. Um, I, I know that there were some concerns with regard to that legislation. Um, and so I, I just am wondering if some of these assets that are in a sense, being decommissioned could potentially be utilized um, for the further deployment of high-speed internet. I would hate to speak to that, Senator. I, I, I'm sure that m many of the assets could probably be repurposed, and again, that's only an assumption on my part. Mm -hmm. um, again, our interest is in public safety, uh, and my understanding is, is you know, the, the, the top uh, uh, section of that tower is, is obviously the most uh, uh, critical for that purpose. Uh, so. Any um, um, any repurposing or reutilization of any assets where public safety would have a an antenna uh, deployed, uh, our interest would be in, in in protecting that to make sure that we have the, the critical uh, uh, tower space that we need. Absolutely, that would be our first priority for for certain. Um, but certainly, it it would be nice to have your support and cooperation going forward. Uh, we've discussed reintroducing the legislation, and if um, that's something that we could have further conversations about, it, it would be very, very helpful, uh, particularly if, if it's not those towers or those parts of the towers are no longer being utilized um, for, for your communications. Um, so sort of switching gears here, um, January was Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, we have legislation that would uh, comport the definition of what human trafficking is to the federal standard. It would also increase penalties and fines on those who traffic individuals and those who patronize individuals that are being trafficked. Um, living along the Interstate 83 corridor, my district is uh, right along it surrounds Interstate 83 coming from Baltimore up to Harrisburg. Um, this has been a major highway for traffickers. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what the state police has been doing to combat human trafficking um, and how we as a, a legislative body can assist in a shared goal of stopping this horrendous crime? Our Bureau of uh, Criminal Investigations is very active in human trafficking investigations within the state and in cooperation with all our federal partners. Uh, we have had additional training that's been pushed out to the members on what to uh, uh, specifics uh, on how to conduct the investigations, what to look for, and so forth. Uh, we would welcome working with you for any uh, legislation that you may seem to pursue? Um, it's Senate Bill 60, and uh, okay. I would very much welcome your input um, in strengthening it and a partnership in into combating this crime. So thank you very much. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Phillips. So, Senator Mensch, followed by Senator Sanacero. Good afternoon, gentlemen, ladies. We appreciate uh, all that you do in the name of safety for we and the citizens of Pennsylvania, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, further comment, if I can, on the radio system uh, just a bit. And um, the, Major Stackhouse deserves every CUDA that she's received here today. I've had her actually visit my district and talk to a collection of uh, EMS folks, and um, she communicates very well. Um, she flattered me too much, but that notwithstanding, it was a it was a well received presentation, and we've had her down several times. So uh, uh, she's a good asset to the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. Now she's working in conjunction with um, Secretary Minnick, and I don't think that we should leave without commenting about uh, Secretary Minnick from the uh, Office of Administration as well. Um, the the what we commonly refer to as the police radio system actually impacts upon 28 departments. Uh, of course, the PSP is the largest user by far, and that's why Major Stackhouse is leading the, uh, the design. But um, her work will, as someone commented earlier, will allow intercommunication between all 28 departments. That is something that we could not have done with the old radio system. Um, so in the face of an emergency, whether it's a snow emergency or, God forbid, something man-made, um, to in the very near future, by the end of next year, we'll have complete intercommunication throughout the state. That's a wonderful thing. I don't know if you have any comment for it, but uh, we appreciate that uh, you gentlemen, your, your department, your organization is leading the charge in the deployment of that system. And we started in the worst part of Pennsylvania, up uh, in the hills uh, of the Northeast, and excuse me, the Northwest, and um, we proved it can work, and we can make it much more efficient and much more cost effective. So it's, it's all a good thing. Um, I want to ask about rape kits or comment about rape kits. You were having a conversation with uh, Senator Langerholt. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, Legislative Budget and Finance Committee did an analysis of uh, what was perceived as a backlog on rape kit uh, reporting. And what we began to find out was that we had differences of definition through the process. And um, uh, many of the, what were being, uh, I, I won't say many, quite a few of the kits that we saw as uh, inventory not yet examined were actually sitting on shelves because the cases had been pulled or they hadn't gone to court or the, um, the accuser for one reason or another uh, we, we never followed through, they never followed through with the prosecution of the case. So they were sitting on the shelf, but uh, um, we were counting them still as a backlog. Have, have we gotten to a better point in the counting and the assessing of, of that today? Senator, to, to your point, uh, the, the recent legislative change that came about in uh, October of last year, um, which compels now a, a, a mandatory reporting by local police agencies and, and the state police. Um, and also that, that uh, same act establishes a definition for what actually truly constitutes a backlog case. And that is anything 12 months or beyond that's been in their possession. So uh, earlier I referenced, uh, referenced uh, the report that was due by the end of the calendar year and the Pennsylvania State Police are capturing that information. Um, that involves sometimes reaching out to some of the local agencies to get information from them. So to date, what we provided is, is what we've been able to get thus far. And because of the short turnaround of when this law came into existence, which was, was in October uh, of last year, um, and the, the uh, startup date being, uh, again, uh, December of, of, uh, of last year, it was a very short turnaround. So we're, we're playing catch up, but we're diligently pursuing that information. Uh, I can tell you the information thus far that, that, that I've seen uh, has shown that there has been a, a, a very good compliance by the law enforcement community across the Commonwealth as a whole. Um, those that, that, uh, that were required to reach out to uh, and maybe prompt them for some information, we've been doing that. Thank you very much. I'm glad we're making some progress. I'd yes, like sir. to add one thing, too. Uh, recently, it came to our attention that we've had some issues uh, where a victim would go to a hospital and whether a local law enforcement was there or not, 
um, they came up to who has jurisdiction and then who assumes custody of the evidence collection kit. So we're looking into that matter, trying to sort through it and see how widespread that is and see if something else needs to be done with that as well. So just something that uh, recently uh, appeared for us. Yeah, and we had seen that in the report as well. And in my comments, I was lumping that uh, kind of together with the, under the definition issue. Uh, one last comment. I'm practically out of time, but I, two years ago, um, Senator Brown established some subcommittees in, in this uh, body through the uh, appropriations process. And I did chair a committee that was looking at, a subcommittee that was looking at the uh, police funding issue. Uh, gentlemen, I can tell you the, the further we dove into that, the bigger the morass uh, it became. Uh, there's an old adage, when you open a can of worms, you always need a bigger can to put the same number of worms back into. Uh, we couldn't find a can big enough. Um, there, there are so many um, isolated and interested special interest groups, uh, state police being one of them, the largest perhaps, but we had the county sheriffs, we had uh, the local police departments, constables, uh, citizen groups. It, it, it's really hard to find a workable solution. And uh, I just want to encourage you to talk to us. If you have an idea, if there's anything that we can begin to process in the way of looking at this intelligently, I have a background in operations research, and I can't figure it out. If you can help us, please. Um, I will. I, I just want to make one more. The, the $15 isn't even close to the real cost. And if we were to implement it tomorrow with the $15, all we're going to see is very angry citizens as this cost increases over the next 10 years or 15 years to the point where it really becomes the cost that it should be. So we need a much more practical solution. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Brown, for indulging me. My pleasure. Senator, Senator uh, thank you, Senator Mench. Uh, Senator, Senator Cerro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for your service to the Commonwealth, and uh, thank you, actually, to all the troopers that, that serve us here in Pennsylvania. We, we do appreciate uh, what you do. Um, I want to ask a little bit about uh, firearm background checks. Uh, can you explain to us briefly what the difference in scope is between the national instant check system and our own Pennsylvania instant check system? Yes, sir. So, um, PICS, uh, obviously, we, we manage and run the PICS system. Uh, PICS hits uh, approximately 14 different databases when we do firearms background checks. One of those background checks is, in fact, NICS. But there are records in Pennsylvania that we have access to that we simply cannot get into the NICS system. The, the most significant of those is, is protection from abuse orders. Looking at this issue over perhaps three or four years, the number of protection from abuse orders with insufficient demographic identifiers has remained relatively stable between 1,000 and 1,500 protection from abuse orders. So what we're talking about there is a protection from abuse order that's granted we have the name perhaps of a defendant, but we don't have a date of birth. We don't have a social security number. That PFA cannot be entered into the National Crime Information Center. It cannot be entered into NCIC. A few years ago, we began a robust program to submit our state prohibiting offenses into NICS, and it was an extensive program. It was funded actually uh, through an NCHIP grant, a National Criminal History Improvement Program grant, so that we can put all of our state prohibiting offenses into NICS, because the federal government doesn't necessarily know what state prohibitors might be. Right. In the course of that project, we actually explored trying to submit those protection from abuse orders directly into the NICS index, into the NICS state index, if you will, a file cabinet of information. Even there, they won't accept the information without a demographic identifier. So one of the uh, groups of records that we have access to through NICS, or through PICS that NICS does not have is those PFAs, and they're a significant concern. And as I said, that's relatively stable. I think they're about 1,400, but it runs between 1,000 and 1,500 at any given time. So there's, there's that um, group of records, if you will, that, that PICS um, has access to. It's threefold. If you look at the public safety aspect, particularly with regard to some of those records and the robustness of the background checks, for us, it's, it, that truly is a, a public safety issue. There's a second element 
that element goes to keeping hands out of the guns of folks that are legally prohibited from having them. The second element, though, in terms of picks and nicks for us is those folks that are legally allowed to possess firearms, we want to make sure that process is as efficient and effective as possible. So for example, if you're denied a firearm in the NICS system and you want to challenge that denial, it's incumbent upon you to get all the records. You submit them to NICS and then NICS makes a determination. You can imagine because of the nature of criminal history and the intricacies and the various information silos, it's not always easy to get those records, particularly for a private citizen. In the case of PICS, you simply tell us you want to challenge the denial and we obtain all the records and we process the denial and we do the research. So that's a customer service perspective, if you will, that, that we offer that, that Nick simply can't accommodate. Um, then thirdly is responsiveness. Uh, NICs, because they, they process transactions nationwide, they do about 8 million transactions a year. We do about 1 million transactions a year in PICs. Uh, we're responsive to you, the legislature, and, and the citizens of Pennsylvania. So if we have a problem with PICs, if we have an outage, um, if there are questions that the legislators have, uh, we're there and we're always available. NICs simply doesn't offer that level of accessibility. But perhaps most significantly and, and uh, tragically timely, we saw the, the incident in Aurora a few days ago with the active shooting incident. One of the things that is being explored in, in that particular instance, and I don't have all the facts on that particular instance, but in the NICS system, if you are attempting to purchase a firearm, and a, an immediate decision can't be made because of lack of records or, or for some other reason, after three days, the default position of NICS is the dealer is allowed to transfer that gun. Now, PICS, we have 15 days, and if we can't make a decision within that 15 days, the way the legislature structured the legislation was prescient because you need an authorization number for the transfer. 15 days, if you don't get the authorization number, you can't perform the transfer. So the individual doesn't get the gun, but has the option to challenge. To give you an idea of the magnitude of that problem now, last year, 2017, you would say, how many transactions potentially went beyond three days and, and were approved, or not approved per se, but were allowed to proceed? There were 310,000 in NICS states. That resulted in 6,000 retrieval investigations where ATF had to go out and try to find those guns once Nix was able to continue the research and determine that it was a prohibited person who had that gun. The cat was out of the bag, so to speak, because right. the individual already had the gun. And if you think of the magnitude then of retrieving 6,000 guns, ATF is one of the smallest <coughs> federal enforcement agencies with 2,600 agents. And they do a phenomenal job but that's a huge undertaking, and that's a huge vulnerability that, that we don't have by maintaining our, our status as a point of contact state. I, I know we're, we're past time, Mr. Chairman, and I, I appreciate your indulgence. I just want to add, and I thank you very much for that because that was very informative and I think very important for not just this committee, um, but for the public and the rest of the General Assembly to hear as well. Because from time to time, we do have proposals here in the General Assembly to do away with PICs and replace it with NICs. And for those of us who argue against that change, um, it's very helpful to hear uh, everything that you just laid out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senators. Uh, we have uh, some time for a second round. Um, Senator Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, uh, first and foremost, has there ever been, you had mentioned about the live scan and the central booking fees, and I remember being part of that when we set one up in Lancaster County and the three-way split of that $300 booking fee that's put on an offender. Was there any, ever any effort to, uh, and if not, I'm definitely interested in looking at that, um, because you're right, if you're the backbone of that live scan system, that, that, that only makes sense. Um, has there ever been any active engagement in advocating for PSP? when any of these counties, which I believe, I think often the president judge has been tasked with formulating it by order, um, or is another way that we can do that up here? Yeah, uh, uh, Senator Martin, um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been a specific effort on the part of the legislature to look at Act, to look at Act 81 and those fee, uh, those fee distributions and so forth. 
Okay. Um, the other question, just technical I have, um, going back to the traffic side of things. When you write a traffic violation of some sort, where speeding or whatnot, um, typically I know uh, if a local police force does, they basically send, what, half the amount goes to the state and half the amount they end up getting back locally. Uh, when you guys write a ticket in a jurisdiction that is yours, I believe the whole amount comes back to the state. Uh, my question to you is, if you write a, a traffic violation or ticket in a jurisdiction that already has, it's a municipality that has its own full-time force, do all the proceeds of that fine come back to the Commonwealth, or does half stay in the municipality that you're doing the pullover in? I'll break this down a couple different ways here. Uh, if we do state police action under Title 75, the fines, uh, forfeited recognizances, or forfeitures imposed uh, go to the motor license fund. From there, one half goes to municipality uh, under the same ratio of the liquid fuels tax allocation. Uh, as long as there's a population of not more than 3,000 people or 40 hours of the local police services. Uh, if the revenue is not paid to municipalities, it is supposed to be earmarked for PSP cadet classes. However, that was changed back in 2012, and I'm not sure exactly how, but that money now goes to the general fund, okay? Uh, if there's a state police prosecution uh, under Title 75 for a DUI offense, uh, all the fines and stuff goes to, 50% goes to the motor license fund. The other 50% goes to the county where the occurrence was. And from there, it's broken down. 50% goes for drug and alcohol programs, and 50% of that goes to county jails and, and prisons. Uh, and finally, uh, if the state police uh, makes any arrest under Title 75 on an interstate highway, uh, all the fines and uh, forfeitures imposed go to the motor license fund. Hopefully that clarifies some of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing that 2012 one that you mentioned that got changed that used to go to the cadet classes. Right. I'm, um, not, I'm not sure where that changed or how that we'll came We'll have to about. try to look that up. Uh, my, my final comment um, or question, um, I know Senator Mensch was here or not, and I know under the pilot under uh, the P25 system um, was looking to get counties involved, you know, under the guise of let's not, you know, reinvent the wheel uh, if there's a way to partner. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but how, how many counties uh, moving forward are looking um, to join forces with you in terms of getting on to the same systems? Uh, and also, are you hearing any in the future, uh, especially as, and I believe the title of it back in 2013, 2014 was the Middle Class Jobs Cut Act that they passed where, in essence, they were going to require those licenses be turned back over to the federal government and a lot of counties that had recently just upgraded their systems. So um, are you hearing anything about that or are more counties looking to get on board uh, with your system and, and try to get that those economies of scale? Senator, my, my understanding is that the counties are very interested in getting on board with the P25 system simply because of the cost savings initiatives, uh, looking to leverage the, the fact that they can get onto those towers. Uh, most recently, Warren County has agreed to join in the statewide radio network. Uh, and in doing so, they're saving the taxpayers of, of Warren County approximately $4 million. Uh, so there's substantial costs that, 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 that again, big ticket items. Um, you know, that's just one example of many that we're seeing across the Commonwealth as we roll this out across the state. Uh, there, there is more and more uh, folks taking advantage of those opportunities. So, and as a follow-up to that, with the 911 legislation that, that was you know, critically passed by, by the General Assembly and signed into law a few years ago, and I believe it needs an extension, do the fees then, if Warren County is, is partnering with you, do the fees that are assigned on the, on the, the, the monthly phone bills um, that fund these systems, do they come to you then instead of being distributed to Warren County? Senator, I'm not sure where those funds would go, but I can look into that and get back to you. Because no, it's it definitely an important point because, you know, in my county, uh, if we're getting that $1.50 uh, per line that's coming to fund, you know, Lancaster County communica countywide communications, um, but if we didn't have a communications, where's that money going to? And my guess is that should be going to you guys. So, I'll let you know, Senator. Well, thank you very much for being here today, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Martin. Deputy, what are the counties paying for use of the system? 
So they're saving a certain amount of money. What are they paying for the use? The, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, Senator, what, what that uh, would cost, but I, again, I can look into that as well and, and have an answer for you. Appreciate a follow-up on that. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Sanicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know our time is, uh, is short, so I just want to quickly, if you could give us an update on where we are with um, minority and uh, women hiring. Yes, sir. So um, most recently, as I mentioned before, some of the some of the changes that we're looking to um, implement, we we engaged with the governor's office of lean um, management to do a complete uh, overview analysis evaluation of our hiring processes. And as Senator uh, Vogel uh, had asked and I, uh, I explained, it's a lengthy process. So we were looking to gain efficiencies in the process, but we were also looking to determine why potentially we were losing diverse applicants through the process. So we engaged with uh, the lean office. We engaged with uh, SCP, strategic consulting partners, uh, in, in an, a similar sort of analysis. And what we've seen is we're, in, in our most recent cadet classes, we see a continuing uptick in terms of, of our diverse candidates. Our most recent cadet classes, um, we've had between 15, 16, 18, and then 20 percent uh, diverse representation, minorities and females. Now, what, what we do see is initial application. You go online, you fill out an application to take the state police test. We're actually seeing about 40 percent um, female and minority representation. But through attrition, um, through the process, we end up 20% uh, going to the academy. Uh, we've been doing some things uh, to, try to, uh, to try to improve our diversity makeup. Uh, just recently, uh, Colonel Vancic uh, had, tax, has, had uh, tasked myself with establishing a diversity committee in the department, which, which will be a standing committee to look at issues interdepartmentally but also externally to determine um, what we can do to potentially bolster uh, our diverse complement. We're also engaging in, in evidence-based practices. So recently we uh, spent a fair amount of money to, to give the uh, entrance test at John Jay University, which is primarily a criminal justice university in New York City. We had a huge representation of diverse candidates, uh, a huge proportion, take the test. Ultimately, though, what we found was many took every test that was offered there, and it wasn't necessarily a desire to come to Pennsylvania and be a Pennsylvania trooper, and, and we, we sort of lost a lot of that representation as, as the process moved on and, and folks got jobs uh, elsewhere, potentially. Um, so currently, as most agencies are, we, we struggle with this issue, but we're seeing uh, gradual improvements. One of the, the kind of interesting things that we've done to prevent attrition in our academy classes is we've begun doing a come get, to, or not a come get to know us day, but a cadet life tour. What we found was we were seeing some attrition when cadets got to the academy and weren't really prepared or didn't understand what it would entail. So we bring our prospective cadets into the academy for a day and let them live the academy life. More important than that, though, it gives them an opportunity to network and so that unfamiliarity of showing up, not knowing anybody, the first day being subjected to what is essentially a military boot camp stress academy, that stress is alleviated um, by bringing, uh, bringing folks in and, and having them network before that day. So we're seeing improvements. We admittedly aren't where we would like to be or need to be, um, but, but we're encouraged by the effect of the, the changes that we put in place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Hughes. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, thank you, gentlemen. I um, just want to follow up on Senator Sanicero's um, uh, line of questioning. Uh, you admitted we've been dealing with this for a long time. How, how, what's, what are the best practices when we had good years, not so good years? How can we replicate that? How much are we spending in terms of actual recruitment? How much are we utilizing to to communicate to folks that these are good options, these are good jobs. Elite law enforcement organization, um, really a, a place you want to have a, 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 a very respected career. What's, and, and I don't want to belabor the time because we are coming close on the, on, on the time. We can have a subsequent conversation on this. I want to get a sense of 
the real level of effort that's going into this space because we've been dealing with this for a long time. Yes, sir. So, so for example, one of the things we think that, that was a flaw in, in our approach was we, we were conflating, if you will, um, advertising with recruiting. Now, advertising is a, a component of recruiting, but at our most recent recruiters conference, we actually went to Penn State. We had Coach Franklin come out and talk about that continual engagement that you need to, to bring candidates, to bring successful candidates from uh, you know, the, the initial interest phase, if you will, matriculate right through the process to graduation from the academy. Um, we actually spent uh, a significant sum of money last year advertising at Penn State, but when we looked at it, it was largely dump, jumbotron at, at football games and things of that nature. We didn't see a lot of return. But what we've, what we've searched for is how, how do we target the candidates in a more effective way? So just recently, and this is an, an ongoing effort that um, we're going to be evaluating, we've engaged with the Data Mining Corporation because what we know is veterans' preference points are significant. If we have potentially 2,000 people take a cadet test, Normally on the list, on the final list, potentially the first 200 are veterans because of the veterans preference points. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we're now engaging with a, a company that does data mining. When veterans are leaving the military, they, they actually uh, provide these companies with contact information. What this company's gonna do for us is take that information and, and essentially cleave out different, uh, different targeted groups, if you will, because we feel that, that, that the way we can really improve some of our, uh, some of our uh, results is to actually look at the diverse candidates that are coming in from the military. And, and so I think in the past sometimes we did things based upon anecdotal information, what we thought might work. Perhaps we didn't engage with the community enough. Perhaps we didn't engage with the stakeholders enough, and, and we thought we knew what was happening. When we get down and start to apply uh, evidence-based kind of analyses, uh, I think we're having better results, and I hope we continue to have better results. So that's, that's kind of an idea of where we were and where we're looking to go. And, and, and I'd be willing um, to, to have some follow-up conversation with, with this. Uh, on this issue, uh, I do notice the time, and we have, a, we have an agenda we have to keep keep track of, um, but the, the continual messaging, you're right, uh, advertising is not recruiting or advertising is a form of, a part of, it's part of a, a longer, fully engaged process, um, but um, it's an elite organization to work for, um, your benefits are good, um, nice solid work, um, and should be attractive, uh, especially um, for more diverse communities to get them an opportunity to participate. But we need to work diligently on this because we've been talking about this over and over and over again for year after year. Um, and sometimes we've had some breakthroughs, but far too often, not too many. So we'd love to have some continued dialogue in this space. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Hughes. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, uh, for your time today. It's been very valuable. Uh, and as everyone, as many have said, uh, as part of our conversations, we all uh, covet your commitment to the uh, health and safety of the citizens of Pennsylvania. Um, Statewide Radio has been part of our f financial concern in relation to public safety for a very long time, so it's, it's great to hear that it seems like we're hitting our stride here. Um, the audit was an important request, I guess, from the last hearing schedule, and it's I'm pleased to see, speaking on behalf of others who are interested in that, that it's uh, apparently done. The audit's finished for that. Deputy? My understanding, Senator. Yes. All right. Um, when would we ex hope to see the results of that? Do you have any, uh, have any idea as I, to the I time? I do not, but I will let you know. I'll look into that and get back to you on that. The scope of the audit, I would believe, would have, um, at minimum, would have quantified the total investment that the Commonwealth has made up to date to the, the, uh, the goal of having a statewide radio system. Is that correct? Senator, I, I, I'm not sure what the scope of the audit is going to encompass or did encompass. Uh, I came into this uh, later in the, in the game, so to speak, uh, and that's why I can't answer that for you, but I will get you that answer. 
All right. It's part of the ongoing confidence and making sure that we're going in the right direction now. Because Understood. I'm guessing um, that we're probably looking in total, up till now, close to a billion dollars to get where we are now. And obviously a very good uh, cause and a very good goal. But um, a billion dollars is a lot of, is a lot of money. Um, and it's, it's good for us to at least have a full understanding of how much we put into, uh, into the system to date. And there was also a hope that during last hearings that in quantifying the number, there would also be an effort by the state police along with the attorney general to see if we can recover some of that money. Um, because the expectation was there would be a fully implemented system that would work for, for you know, your needs, for local needs, uh, with, in f far less time in a far more efficient fashion. That was a, also a request from the hearings last year, that the audit would lead to that. Um, is that something that you are planning to do? The audit's got to lead to something. And it's good from a transparency information perspective, but it's, it should also lead to a, and you had mentioned some legal issues that are holding up conversations about this. I would expect those legal issues are a foundation of evidence to be used to recover some of the money. Any, any comments on that? I agree wholeheartedly with your, your, uh, your assessment. And uh, to my knowledge, there are some legal issues uh, that I don't know that I'm privy to speak of at, at this, at this uh, forum. You know, but you're not just privy to speak. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I don't want to put you on this speak, one. I won't do that to you, I'm only kidding around. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, something that we're working on together with all the agencies, hopefully cooperating along with them. Um, and that is a separate platform for review for us in regards to our financial uh, obligations. We're trying to set up a performance-based um, method for evaluating spending. Um, it's an interesting conversation in relation to law enforcement and regulatory agencies because you have to think about what the actual outcome of the work is. It's not the actual enforcement activity, it's what you're doing the enforcement for. And, you know, that is, needs to be thought through uh, thoroughly because you don't want to, in order to get performance, you don't want to uh, run into the inappropriate concept of enforcement quotas to get where you want to go. Uh, it's just what you're, you're actually putting into the field and what the results are in terms of what you want to achieve. Um, in your documentation, you do have some documented some goals that the state police wants to meet but over 1920 in terms of the uh, reductions of violent crime and other things. Over the next two years, the IFO is going to engage with all agencies that tried to make this meaningful. It isn't meaningful if the only thing we're getting out of this is how much work we're doing, how much enforcement we're doing. What's meaningful is what we're doing the enforcement for in the first place, how people, you know, and you'd have to look across the whole broad scope of all what you do, but, you know, it's anecdotally the reduction in overall uh, crime rates as a result of what you do when it comes to enforcement is would be an example of that. Um, your participation in that is, would be very valuable to us because we really want to make sure that what we're investing in is, uh, and especially in your space, which is the most fundamental space we have, and that is the safety of our citizens. Um, the f financial position of the Commonwealth continues to be stressed. And we all have to, notwithstanding how important uh, what we're doing is, and yours is the most important, uh, to try to ensure that we're always thinking about the most efficient, effective way to spend our money to the highest level of performance. And I know you think about that, but this will take that a different level. So your participation in that would be much appreciated. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Look forward to working with you in the future. Have thank a good you, day. Sir. We will take a 10 minute break and then uh, we'll conclude our day with the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency.
Let's settle in, folks. I know you all want to stay with us all day, but we have to settle in. I call the Senate Appropriations Committee to order for our final session of the day with the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and the State Fire Commissioner with us this afternoon is Acting Director Randy Padfield, Jeff Thomas, the Executive Director, Deputy Director of FEMA, and Jeff Boyle, Deputy for 911, and our State Fire Commissioner Bruce Trigo. Gentlemen, can I ask you all to be stand and be sworn, please? You swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please swear or affirm. We begin with our standing committee. Uh, chairman with oversight over our participants for this afternoon, starting 10 minutes, starting with Senator Regan. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be uh, getting to know both of you pretty well as the new chairman of uh, Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness. I'm looking forward to working with you as we have several issues, major issues, to deal with uh, this session, a June 30th deadline to reauthorize the 911 law, an ongoing effort to rewrite our emergency management code, Title 35. Uh, the implementation of the SR6 fire and EM EMS um, commission report in the reauthorization of the fire and EMS grant program. So we're going to be busy and I look forward to working both of you. And I'll start with uh, a question for you, Mr. Padfield. Um, you know, I, I, first I should preface this by saying that uh, I know there are, there's no doubt in my mind that, that, that Governor Wolf um, when he weighed, and I know you have a 30-year background in emergency preparedness, and, and uh, you're quite qualified for this job as acting director, but one of the things we talked about in the last session was the, the Pima director being a, a uh, um, Senate confirmation position, and some legislation was floated uh, in that regard. Um, let's not talk about you, and let's not talk about Governor Wolf, but let's look to the future. So a future governor in this era of terrorism um, and so many things that have happened from natural disasters and, and whatever, it seems like it's more prevalent now than it was in the past. Uh, 
Do you think that it's wise that we have a Pima director who has not undergone the scrutiny of, of Senate confirmation? Senator, thank you for your question. Obviously, it's a difficult question to be able to answer. If we take a look at it from a historical perspective, it has uh, not, uh, it's been talked about previously. It's something that's come up in the past. Uh, personally, I don't believe it has hampered the ability of the agency in the past to be able to respond. Uh, obviously, uh, from our perspective, or from, from my perspective, um, picking the most qualified candidate for the job is key to be able to do that. Uh, the job has a lot of intricacies uh, that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, it requires, it, we're a relatively small agency with a lot of breadth of capability um, and things that we're tasked to be able to do. Um, so from my perspective, I, I don't necessarily um, have the ability to weigh in one way or another. Uh, I look at it from having the most qualified candidate to be able to um, lead the agency, to be able to uh, understand the core principles and values of what the agency needs to do and to be able to move the agency forward. So I really don't have an opinion either way from my perspective to be able to do that. I know historically uh, the agency has functioned, uh, there's been some great leadership at the agency in the past uh, and has the ability to be able to do that. Uh, and moving forward. I hope that answers your So, question. I mean, I guess, n not to press you mm -hmm. in, in, in any way, shape, or form, I'm not uh, attempting to, to do that, but um, I guess by that rationale that the governor appoints his, uh, his, his golfing buddy who may have a background in uh, shoe sales uh, to be the, the Pima director, uh, under current law, there's nothing stopping that from happening, correct? Correct, and, and uh, you bring up a very valid point. Obviously, uh, from our agency's perspective, a lot of times the agency, emergency management in general, is not something that's thought about early on. It's usually thought about during the times of crises, and uh, usually that's when it comes to the forefront. Obviously, any governor that comes into office uh, would weigh that rather heavily because they do not want to have an Achilles heel. They want to make sure that they have the best qualified person to be able to do that. And unfortunately, especially with, uh, if you take a look at the history of disasters, um, they become sometimes more frequent. Um, and obviously, I don't believe any governor would ever want to run the risk of having a less than qualified person in the Well, you wouldn't position. think so. I'm sorry? You wouldn't think so. And I guess that's my point. You know, you don't ever know what a governor's going to do. Right. Uh, he can act unilaterally in these issues as the way the law is now. So, I mean, I think, um, I guess my point is I think it's, it's a more prudent uh, effort, much like we do the commissioner of the state police, is to have uh, some sort of oversight in the appointment. So. And, and, and I could definitely understand uh, your side of that because obviously from a, it gets you to, to know the person a little bit better. You have trust and confidence in that person. So I can obviously see the benefits on that side as well. Okay. Well, thank you for your honesty and your candor. And uh, I, my next question, hello, Mr. Mr. Trago. Uh, congratulations on uh, being named the, uh, the uh, state fire commissioner. That's a, a new appointment for you. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I just have a, a, a a quick question uh, for you, and that is, uh, you know, last year my pre predecessor, Senator Velakovich, led a bipartisan commission uh, that made 92 individual recommendations to address the crisis facing our fire and EMS uh, community. You participated in the Senate Resolution 6 Commission and were supportive of all the recommendations. However, I was a little disappointed that during the governor's uh, budget address, nothing uh, regarding uh, SR6 was mentioned. Um, can you tell me where the governor is on, on this and uh, what are your recommendations to him and how do you think we're going to proceed forward? Well, very good questions, sir, and uh, thank you. Uh, my experience on, on SR6 uh, was coming in kind of, kind of late, but uh, I, I do support the workings of the SR6 commission. Uh, I cannot give you fully the, the answers as to how the governor feels just yet. We are going to meet with the governor's staff in the very near future to discuss the priorities. Uh, my takeaway from SR6 is uh, that there are a lot of good recommendations in there. However, uh, most are going to require legislation. And, uh, the, the, and I, I've said this quite a few times before, there's really no cookie-cutter solution in there that's going to 
repair and bring the recruitment retention back to where it was years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's going to take some work both on uh, from the legislative side as well as from from the governor's side and, and our side by investigating it a little bit further on what's going to work best for everyone. But uh, I will say that our office is willing to work with the legislator at legislature and, and in particularly you folks as we move forward to, to try to address those those 27 items. Thank you very much uh, for your response. I look forward to working with you on these issues, both of you. And thank you very much for your, your very fine service to, uh, to our Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Regan. Standing Committee Chair, Senator Williams. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so building on a little bit of what Senator Regan was asking about the um, recommendations out of SR6, is there anything that is in the current proposed budget that is going to help implement some of those recommendations? And if not, what are some of your priorities in terms of going through those list of recommendations? Some of the, uh, the recommend recommendations that we are already addressing uh, we're on the recruitment side, some advantages, the, the taxes, the tax breaks, um, the fireworks tax, uh, it's going to allow us to proceed further with online training. And uh, my priorities are going to be what's best for both recruitment as well as retention. I think we really need to work hard on retention. Uh, my, my concern is we lose, in 2017, we lost more firefighters to suicide than we did line of duty. Uh, so my concern is, are we taking care of the folks that we have now, and what can we do as we move forward to, to help those folks and to, to retain those folks, as well as recruitment. I'm not saying recruitment isn't important. It is, it is important, but if we look at our entry-level training program, we are doing as many entry-level training courses as what we have done in the past, and in fact, in some cases, more. So uh, I guess my concern is where are they? Uh, you know, why, why aren't we getting those folks to come out? Legislatively, what are some of the things we can do to address some of those recruit and retention? Well, again, uh, it's difficult to say until we find out exactly what's going to work best for the areas. Uh, you know, uh, for, for example, I think uh, if we look at education, can we help with education? Uh, can we retain the people by giving them some kind of a, uh, a, a retribution, I'm sorry, a reimbursement for their, their education if they're going to stay in, in the Commonwealth? Um, you know, in my younger days, when I first started attending the State Fire Academy, one of my first instructors taught me that, or said to us, you know, in Pennsylvania, we teach the three R's, reading, writing, and roads south. And, you know, I, I, I kind of thought it was rather humorous, but if you look at what we do, we train a lot of firefighters and EMS folks, and they end up moving south to get a career position. So. Um, don't know if I'm hitting okay. it right, but I think you know where I'm headed. Yep. Um, so you mentioned that we've had an increase in, in deaths of firefighters and also state police with over this last year. Are there things, specific things that your department is working on in order to address that? I, I'm sorry. And, uh, is there certain programs that you're working on to address the increase in, in suicides of our emergency responders? And is there something that we can do to be helpful? Uh, yes, right, right now I look at there's a lot of agencies putting several, uh, I'm sorry, uh, there are a lot of uh, areas where you can take online training. Uh, we're working with Department of Health to try and, and find something that is going to work for all disciplines. Uh, I, I realize that law enforcement people want to talk to law enforcement people. Mm -hmm. and, and Fire and EMS are pretty much the same way. Uh, we are incorporating activities into our entry-level training to provide at least an awareness level of, you know, what it is that you're really getting into. Thank you. Um, Director Padfield, I had a question on um, the budget. I was looking at the cuts to the Hazardous Material Response Fund, um, proposed cuts, and it was my understanding that those were because of one-time costs. Is, is that correct? 
So I'm just wondering why we're not going to need that that additional money for response. And spe you know, we have c counties like Allegheny County that are res responding to landslides and kind of struggling. So I was just wanted a little insight into how you felt about where those line items were coming uh, in at. And you're specifically referring to the hazardous materials. Yeah, response there's a fund. couple. There's a couple things right under under there. Grants to counties in in particular. Um, that had some cuts. So the Hazardous Materials Response Fund uh, is predicated on actually fees uh, based on uh, threshold reporting quantities of chemicals. So what we've seen uh, over the last couple of years is a trend downward, and it's really because of people using less chemicals, being more environmentally friendly. Um, so actually it's a trend in the good direction. We're currently taking a look at that response fund to see what, uh, what the impacts are long term. Uh, as we move forward. But that's why you see a decrease in those revenues coming in because people are being more environmentally friendly. There's less quantity of um, uh, product that is on hand. They're taking steps and procedures to be able to um, change their manufacturing process and not have these commodities on hand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Williams. Move on to members uh, for five minutes. Uh, Senator Vogel, started by, uh, followed by Senator Langerholz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my first question, Mr. Padfeld, uh, field. Uh, in the ag budget, there's, I think, $3 million set aside in case there was an avian influenza flu outbreak or something along, and any kind of outbreak would happen, any kind of emergency along those lines. What is Pima's role, or do you have a role at all if something like that would happen? Do you work? With the ag department somehow would you be a communications type situation well, do you have any role at all in if something some kind of an influenza outbreak of some sort across the state in agriculture or anything would happen what, what is your role or do you have a role or it's a, a very good question we do have a role so um very similar to any other emergency that we would have our primary uh, responsibility is coordination of state agency and coordination of effort and response so uh, obviously we would take a look at an outbreak such as that. We would bring the state agencies together to be able to define a course of action or multiple courses of action and then figure out what, is, what are going to be the best approaches to that. Um, so usually other state agencies, um, and I usually like to use the phrase that, you know, none of us are as smart as all of us. Uh, and when we bring the state agencies together, there's a lot of overlap at times, and it's really understanding everyone's lanes of travel, what they are good at, and what they can help with. And it's really establishing that collaborative approach amongst the state agencies to be able to respond to situations. Some of the situations we don't see on a regular basis, uh, some of the situations we do. Uh, an example of that would be the opioid epidemic uh, and bringing the state agencies together. Obviously, we're not going to be the lead, but we actually help in coordinating other agencies we actually have the uh, uh, contacts in the 911 community and the emergency management community, and they may not have a full stake in it, but they have a stake in the response somehow. So that's really our primary coordination responsibility across the state agencies. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. I'm glad to know that. I was just curious as how that worked or what your, what your role was in, in a situation like that. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Trago, my next question goes to you, and uh, I guess I want to sort of follow up on what Senator Williams was talking about, the... Uh, funding from the fireworks tax. Uh, how much money is involved in that at this point in time? It hasn't been in, implemented very long, but I mean, do you know what mm -hmm. amount of money, money you have received so far? Yes, uh, the, the first amount of money we received, we received was $17,000. And uh, we applied that to a, a program, a software program to help with a, a command class across the Commonwealth so that it, it was available to, to everybody. Uh, in, in working with the uh, Department of Revenue, they anticipate about $300,000 this time uh, because it was not a full year. Uh, so what we're looking at there is obviously being able to move forward with online training and blended learning. How many people could be served by online training with that kind of dollars? Um, good question. Uh, our, our plan is, is right now is to take a look at do we have the, the staff what, do we, what adjustments do we need to make in order to provide that? We need somebody uh, that is very familiar with the curriculum in order to make it a, a good blended learning. Obviously, most of our classes require hands-on. doesn't mean that we can't do some of it online. Um, we've had a, a great success with some two resident programs at the State Fire Academy where we experimented with uh, blended learning. Uh, the students take a, a three-hour 
on the one course, four hour on the, on the other course, online strictly uh, uh, at their time, their, their leisure. Uh, when they come to the State Fire Academy, they show up in the apparatus bay, do a gear inspection, and go down on the training grounds and never step foot in the classroom. Uh, so we're looking at what kind of time commitment that would take to address the priority programs, such as our entry level training programs, how much can we do online and how much can we? So it's gonna take some research to give you a really good, accurate answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I believe that it, the money's there to use and I hope you use it uh, appropriately and wisely because uh, we worked hard to get the, the whole gist of the fireworks tax thing was to put the money into the fire departments and that's so you could use that. So uh, I'm glad to hear that. But also the next thing, we constantly hear about fire departments, volunteer fire departments being understaffed and everything and not having enough volunteers to go out on calls and things like that. Is there any funding or grant money or anything you can do to help fire departments in, or encourage them to merge? That's, that's probably a bad word. People don't like to hear that word, but I mean, uh, is there anything uh, in your purview of things you can do or uh, do you have funding available to? Well, the one thing that we do is in our grant, our uh, annual grant, we do appropriate more money to people that are merging, consolidating, and uh, we don't penalize them for that. For 10 years after they consolidate, they can still get the money for the two or the three companies. So we try to incentivize that. Obviously, we can't enforce or force anybody to do that, but we, we try to provide an incentive that way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Vogel. Senator Lego Hold Five by Center Street. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your service, and thank you for what you do. Uh, as a for my first foray into politics was as a township supervisor, and I know the benefit that our volunteer fire departments, that our EMS, that our ambulance services provide, and really it is the backbone for our commonwealth, the backbone for our local communities. And I know the service that is provided. I live in Richland Township. We have a volunteer fire department, and the value and the benefit that they provide if it were a paid department would be it would be a, a severe hit on the budget in our in my local township our first responders oftentimes see the worst of the worst i'm talking about on scene when they're first to to arrive and in as a follow up to a question that was asked with regard to suicide rates i hear from EMS and ambulance services in my district that are concerned with that, what they see, the traumatic effects that it has on them. And they tell me that they don't have the opportunity for any type of counseling or any type of uh, follow-up to be able to talk to somebody. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that that's occurring you know, entirely across the Commonwealth, but there clearly are pockets and services that are not getting that supporter being able to talk what are we doing what can we do to address this and i understand it's it's a monetary issue i get that uh my question is that the, the, the resolution sr6 address any of that can we implement something to allow these people who are giving of their time and are seeing this traumatic these accidents or, or these different scenes how do we address that and how do we get them the appropriate counseling if they should desire it oh very good good questions and uh we've struggled with that quite a bit uh law enforcement fire ems when it when you talk about getting them some type of stress relief or talking to someone they want to talk to their own uh, they want to stay with their own discipline that's just the way they are um they the national volunteer fire council as well as the uh, first responder network is working on a, a good quality program for all all three types of responders with numbers phone numbers for them to call peers um, and I, I like to refer to it and, and director padfield and i go back a, a little ways on this in the olden days we we were when we started we were pretty much told if we saw something we didn't like and complained about it uh, suck it up, kid. That's part of the job. Um, that's not the case any, anymore. And I think the biggest thing that we did was 
you know, be it right or wrong, we, occasionally we would uh, uh, indulge ourselves with adult beverages. Uh, but at the same time, we talked. And I think that's the biggest issue, one of the bigger issues that we're facing is they don't want to talk to someone. Um, so what, we're, what I'm trying to do is get the word out. You don't have to talk to uh, a psychiatrist if you don't want to, but at least talk to a peer. Start a conversation because that's the only way that, that you're going to get that off of your mind and, get, and, and start moving forward. Um, uh, along with, with that uh, talking to a peer is we need to also have our leaders recognize what the signs and symptoms are of, of a, a de depressed responder or a, an anxious responder. Uh, there are several EMS folks that, I, that I've talked to that do rehab and they, they are, they're looking at it as they rehab firefighters on the fire ground. Uh, you know, is, is there something that they saw? And again, it, it's tough because it may not be next week after you've seen something. It might be two weeks, it might be three weeks, it might be years later when uh, a sound or a smell uh, is familiar and takes you back. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, if we can capture them all at once, but I think making people aware and pushing, starting a conversation. Where are we at with regard to that, the phone number or the, or the call in? Where is that in the process? We, we have links on our website for folks to go to that, and I think what we probably should do, sir, is. How do, how do we publicize that? How do we make that aware for everyone? I mean, can we, obviously, we'll get that, we can share that on our different social sure. media. Sure, we can get that information to you to share on, on your site. I would as appreciate well. that. Absolutely. My, my next question is a follow up as well to uh, my colleague, Senator Vogel, with regard to consolidation. And you had, uh, in your answer, began to, to talk about the, the 10 year period. And that's a perfect segue into what I want to ask. And I've asked this question, I think it was last year, if not the year before. I had, when I uh, first got elected as a Richland Township Supervisor. There were three fire departments in my township, and they were undergoing a consolidation. And let me tell you, the passion that you have for your different departments, you can imagine, you know, what you're walking into. Everybody has, you know, right. thankfully it, it went seamlessly, and it went smoothly for the better part, and there's uh, one department now, and actually they did also consolidate with the neighboring Geistown Borough. So there are four departments that are now one, the Richland Township. Uh, fire department. They would receive, I think it was $25,000 for the four different departments. So what, 25,000 times four is 100,000. Now they're in danger of receiving $25,000. And I understand they've got the extension and you had talked about that for the 10 year period that they can keep continuing to receive that money. But for other departments that might be contemplating consolidation, which would help with delivery of services, what do you tell them that um, for only 10 years you're going to get this and then your, your funds are going to be reduced significantly as in that case? And how do we address that going forward? Well, um, and again, I know it's a money issue. We had, you know. It's definitely a money issue. And I, I, the only thing off the top of my head that I could think of is can we extend it longer um, through legislation? Can we, can we extend it longer for those folks that have done that? Or maybe give some, some type of an, a, a merit award for those folks, a merit, merit type of financial, uh, as, especially the, the success stories. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Langerholtz. Uh, Senator Street, followed by Senator Phillips Hill. Uh, gentlemen, one, um, thank you for your service and uh, that you provide to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, in many areas, we, there have been many reports that rainfall has not continued to uh, increase over the past several years uh, in various areas of the Commonwealth. Um, invariably, that results in some rather severe flooding. Um, you all have the, uh, have the responsibility to responding to that, and we appreciate what you've done. Um, two things. One, is there an associated cost with having to respond to the to uh, increase to, to increase rainfall and the flooding that results, and would um, increased development of green infrastructure to sort of support in, in upstream areas so that we don't have uh, so much flooding downstream 
would that mitigate some of the, uh, the, the natural disasters that we see in the Commonwealth? Thank you, Senator. Uh, two very good questions and something that I actually like talking about. So um, obviously, if you look at, we, we like to use data to inform our deci decision making. So if you take a look at the data, uh, Northeast United States over the last several decades has had a 75% increase in uh, significant precipitation events that are shorter duration and higher intensity. So what we're seeing is obviously the pockets of flooding, um, the challenges that we have, there are costs associated with that. So to give you an idea, last year alone in 2018, um, we have had probably about $163.5 million of public assistance damages, public infrastructure damages. Um, of that $163.5 million, uh, we've only been able to achieve a federal disaster declaration uh, for one incident that equated to $62 million. Um, Dollars. So obviously that leaves a lot in the gap that we have to, you know, the local municipalities and the counties have to absorb and the state agencies have to absorb. Um, so what we're seeing is the trending is um, higher intensity, shorter duration incidents that have smaller localized damage and it, we're unable to get to the federal disaster thresholds for public assistance and also individual assistance. So another example is uh, in 2018, uh, for individual assistance, they use the threshold of about 800 homes that are either destroyed or severely damaged. Um, in 2018, we had a total of 5,206 homes that were residential occupancies that were, that were damaged by the flooding. Unfortunately, the way that played out, at no one point in time did we have over 800 homes to apply for an individual assistance declaration through FEMA to be able to get that. Um, so there are some significant gaps that we're seeing right now. Uh, as we move forward and uh, look at things, obviously we look at the cost to be able to mitigate away from or mitigate some of these hazards. So uh, currently for every $1 of mitigation funding that is spent, it saves us about $7 in the response and recovery. So it's really paying that forward. Uh, we have several mitigation projects, actually a lot of mitigation projects identified. So to give you an idea with the federal disaster declaration that we received in 2018 for the 60, about $62 million, we will get about $10 million or thereabouts of mitigation funding through the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. Of that, we have, I believe, 70 some odd projects in the pipeline uh, that equate to over $30 million. So there is a huge need and there's not enough funding to go around to be able to support the mitigation. And the mitigation is really preventing the impact in the future. So when we take a look at things like uh, Governor Wolf's Restore PA program, that really resonates with us significantly because there are significant gaps. Even with all the federal support that is available, small business association, um, low interest loans, uh, everything else that's out there, all the good work that the voluntary organizations that are active in disasters do for the people that are impacted, there are still significant gaps and we really need to be able to close those significant gaps and also to be able to take a look at what we can do in the future. Um, and we have a number of mitigation projects. There's a lot more mitigation projects out there. The key is being able to fund them and fund them appropriately to be able to move them forward. So we decrease our liability in the future for these kind of devastating shorter duration, high impact incidents that uh, aren't going to get us to a federal threshold to be able to get a federal disaster declaration. And really the, the uh, federal side of the house is looking at the states because of the devastating disasters they've had over recent years, it's really looking at the states to be able to absorb more of those costs. Um, classic example, we've applied for the uh, a federal disaster declaration for the landslides out west in Westmoreland, Allegheny County because they were devastating. It's about 20 some odd million dollars worth of uh, impact on that. So when in reality, we really met that threshold because our threshold for state and public assistance is about 19, a little over $19 million, about $19.1 million. The challenge is the requirements they have, it has to be a continuous event. And as you know, that wasn't a continuous event. It was multiple rain events over multiple periods of time. So that creates problems. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the very thorough answer. I think it's important that um, we under, it, it provides some, con some context when we start talking about 
uh, developing and investing in green infrastructure, some of, much of which um, has disaster mitigation implications. Um, and I think that the uh, landslide was a good example. Um, that, again, wouldn't, wouldn't be eligible because it wasn't a single event uh, activity. Uh, and I find it particularly um, interesting that it's a one to seven dollar return on those investments in terms of savings. Um, I think that, but moreover for colleagues, this is, this is likely to create jobs in Pennsylvania, and so it has the added the benefit of, uh, of stimulating our economy while saving money in terms of the disaster mitigation and, and, and quite frankly, makes, improves the quality of life for all of those Pennsylvanians who will be impacted by those uh, tragedies. I, want, I know I'm, I'm out of time, but I do want to point out that um, this is an important issue as we can, given global warming, and we're, pro we're likely to see a continuing trends of increased rainfall and uh, disasters of this like. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you, Senator Street. Senator Phillips Hill, followed by Senator Lachlan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Congratulations, Commissioner Trago. Um, so over the last few weeks, my office has received several complaints over the governor's emergency declarations that have banned all commercial traffic, including trucks and buses on interstate. So I've heard from many businesses who expressed it's really been a logistical nightmare for them, that it's um, also created some significant costs for them. Um, in January, uh, there was a, a declaration that banned commercial vehicles on interstates and state roads. It started at noon. You know, snow didn't start until much later after that. These shutdowns are happening with a few inches of snow and, and recognizing that public safety is very important. But I represent a, a district that borders Maryland, and, and that's posing some great challenges. Um, we don't see those kinds of things happening there. Um, so I had trucks that were forced to delay their deliveries over 24 hours to many businesses and factories in the 28th district. Um, and we are a transportation hub. We're the Keystone State for a reason, right? Everything has to cross Pennsylvania to, to get up and down the East Coast. Um, and, and much of the traffic out west comes through Pennsylvania as well. Um, we're also the, the snack food capital of the world, right? So we had trucks of potatoes that couldn't be delivered, which means the chips that we all love to eat weren't being made. So... Um, Can you walk us through the process of what determines these commercial vehicle restrictions? Um, you know, is there a forecasted snowfall amount that determines, you know, what action is taken? I'm hearing that this is a relatively new um, policy or that the threshold has been drastically lowered from prior administrations. So has, has there been a, a change in policy for declaring these emergencies? Thank you for your question. And uh, if I can provide some additional context, uh, when we take a look at this, we go back to, and I'm sure many of you are aware of in 2007, the Valentine's Day incident where we actually shut down 78 and 81. In 2016, we actually had uh, the snowstorm Jonas on the, uh, the turnpike that resulted in multiple travelers stranded for multiple hours, hundreds of travelers. We have had incidents like that since then that haven't uh, garnered um, as much media attention. Um, but even last year in uh, March of uh, 2018, we had an incident in the Northeast because of a significant snowstorm, which stranded travelers for 10, 12, 14, sometimes in case, some cases 16 hours on the interstate. And as you alluded to, Pennsylvania is the keystone state. And one of the challenges that we've seen working with the other state agencies, and really the, these decisions aren't made in a vacuum. So we really work with Pennsylvania State Police, we work with uh, PennDOT, and we also work with the Turnpike Commission to be able to take a look at these. Uh, one thing that's been very clear, after 2016, we met as a group of state agencies to come up with what we uh, call the State Highway Closure Framework. That framework was in direct um, response to what occurred on the Turnpike and, and some of the other areas where people were stranded for long periods of time. A lot of good work came out of that. We took a look at uh, uh, delineating responsibilities amongst the state agencies. We rely a lot on the local response 
responders and when we have people stuck on the roadways to be able to go out and support them and conduct health and safety checks and make sure that they ha their well-being is taken care of because we may or may not in the middle of a snow event be able to evacuate them off the roadway and that may not be necessarily the best course of action but sheltering them in place requires manpower and it requires local manpower and as we've heard uh, a lot of times the volunteers uh, are smaller in number and it creates a lot of challenges so even with our best attempt after 2016 to be able to address this with quick clearance to be able to get the roadway open to be able to release the trap queue of passenger vehicles that are stuck on the roadway we still continue to experience incidents where we've trapped uh, motorists on the roadway for significant hours and we've at one point it becomes a huge inconvenience which we understand but at, at certain points it becomes a true life safety threat for these people and we've seen that transition to a life safety issue so we know of people in the Northeast last year in March uh, one individual on Interstate 84 had a medical emergency and succumbed and died because of that. There were heroic efforts from the local emergency responders and Pennsylvania State Police to be able to evacuate that person and try to get them to care. But unfortunately, even their best efforts uh, did not result in a successful outcome in that case. We know of another instance where a baby was born in the trap queue. We know that 911 centers get inundated with calls the longer the people are stuck out there on the roadway because people are transiting and they have um, children with special health care needs. They have elderly folks that have special health care needs. There's diabetics that need food, those types of things. So even despite our best efforts to be able to consolidate what we do across the state agencies and pre prevent this or essentially respond to it and open the trap queue to be able to get those people off the roadway, we still had these incidents occurring. Uh, it was very clear from uh, our agency's perspective and the other agencies that were charged with this that the governor's office made it very clear that we need to switch to more of a preventative strategy when it comes to this. And this is the result that we're seeing right now is the preventative strategy. If we can prevent these incidents from occurring, because even when the roadways were closed for 12, 14, 16 hours, the commercial vehicles were still impacted. They weren't moving. In a lot of cases, we would um, you know, have wreckers move them and they would go down the road two more miles and then get stuck two more miles and create more problems. So um, we've taken a preventative strategy by being proactive and trying to limit and using some of the data that we have to drive that decision making. Uh, we're maturing that process significantly as we go. Uh, yesterday's example was a classic example in response to uh, a lot of the concerns of we're banning or restricting commercial vehicles on the roadway because uh, or before, well in advance of um, the snow getting there. So yesterday with the sequenced or phased approach, we were probably about two hours too late in the situation. We had a number of commercial vehicles that caused challenges or were involved in incidents along the roadway that closed Interstate 83, Interstate 78, and they were short-term closures, which was good. Um, but we're seeing that. So it's a maturing process right now. We understand there is a huge impact to the industry, but we're really looking at it pre from a preventing the life safety side of the situation that occurs out there. And we've seen it time and time again. So we've worked proactively with the industry. We've actually met uh, recently at the Turnpike Commission with an advisory committee to be able to sit down and to kind of discuss this. And they actually put a working group together to provide us recommendations from a state agency perspective. Um, and we don't, unfortunately, have a crystal ball to be able to get this right all the time. But we're, we're constantly looking at that. The key from our perspective is being very flexible and nimble, that when we roll these on and roll these off, we understand time is money in a lot of these situations. So we try to take them off as soon as possible. There are situations where we forecasted putting them on. The forecast did not pan out. And we actually rolled them back before they were ever designed to go on. So we're doing our due diligence to try and manage that as effectively as possible amongst all the state agencies that are involved. I would appreciate the constant refinement of the process because, mm -hmm. as I've said, it's really caused significant uh, costs and uh, issues for many businesses in, in Southern New York County and, and I think probably in other parts of the state as well. And, and of course, safety is always uh, very important and the safety of our first responders as well. Um, so I would appreciate that and if possible would appreciate having the opportunity to review um, that policy that you've put in place. 
Sure, and it, we're in the process of finalizing that right now, and we will uh, socialize that as soon as we have it finalized, and we plan to get that out actually to everybody else. There's no one threshold that we use. It's really a complexity analysis, taking a look at, uh, back in January is a classic example, when we had temperatures that were going to be in the minus 20s and minus 30s, the wind chills, we had no ability in that situation to shelter in place anybody on the roadway. We we're going to significantly compromise them. So that was a much different decision-making process than what we used yesterday. If that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Phillips Hill, Senator Lachlan, followed by Senator Santacero. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, my, my questions will be directed towards Commissioner Trago. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, and if I'm if I'm mistaken, you can correct me. But I, I've been told that uh, you plan to have a renewed push for uh, residential sprinklers. Is that true? No. <laughs> well, you've ruined all my fun then. <laughs> uh, uh, at, at this time, uh, we're looking at the advantages of sprinklers, but there's been no commitment either way. Okay, uh, that, that, I have to admit that was not the response that I was expecting, but uh, I, as long as I have the mic, I'll weigh in a little bit. Sure. Uh, in 2010, when there was the first push uh, with Commissioner Mann, uh, I, I was, I'm a residential builder, so that's why I was researching it back then. Uh, and I researched it fairly extensively. And, uh, and what I found is uh, that about 95% of the residential structure fires occur in, in older homes, not anything built roughly after 1960. Uh, and I also did some research and I contacted uh, a guy, now keep in mind this was nine years ago, so if I might uh, get something a little bit wrong. Uh, I, I talked to a guy by the name of Jay Fleming. He was the assistant chief of the Boston Fire Department at the time. and. Uh, and I talked to him quite a bit and emailed him back and forth. And, uh, and what, we, what I came to realize is that monitored smoke detectors save lives. Uh, sprinklers really don't. And I just wanted to say that, you know, in this setting so, it, so it's out there. Uh, the, uh, and the difference, the difference, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, uh, most of the fire fatalities are, are from smoldering cushions on, on sofas and different things like that, not actual flames. Uh, and most deaths occur from smoke inhalation. So uh, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, through this. Uh, I would say that uh, adding monitored smoke detectors to our existing housing stock, especially the older stuff, would actually probably make a pretty big impact uh, in saving lives and also the lives of firefighters because the response time would be so much shorter. So. Anyway, thank you. You're welcome. I, I see both sides of, of the story. Um, and, and we need to take a good look at community risk reduction. What's yeah. the best way? Uh, for example, uh, over 50% of the fire fatalities in Pennsylvania last year were people 55 years of age and older. So if you start looking at it that way and looking at what is the best way to reduce that risk, in some areas, it might be a sprinkler. In some areas, it might be something else. So um, for me to commit that I am on either side right now, I, we need to talk. And I look forward to working with you on that. I look forward to working with you as well, Commissioner. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Sanicero waves off, so uh, Senator Collette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, Commissioner Trago, I have some questions um, regarding the opioid epidemic and specifically um, how you are, uh, what efforts you're taking to identify resources for firefighters. I am a former trauma nurse, and like firefighters, uh, nurses experience a lot of pain from uh, their very physical jobs, um, a lot of psychological sure. uh, problems from the trauma that they are involved in. And I'm wondering what you're doing to identify those same uh, areas of concern for our firefighters and how you're making sure that firefighters have the resources available to them to um, uh, actively uh, deal with pain issues, chronic pain issues, as well as psychological trauma instead of uh, substance uh, abuse or um, uh, self-medication. Thank you. 
Oh, you heard me talk about adult beverages, right? Yeah, okay. Um, what, what we're working on is, is behavioral health issues and how we can address that with the fire departments, not only for um, the, the suicide or the, the stress, but also for cancer awareness. So I, I think um, um, one of the things that I started saying last year to our instructors is clean up your act. And I didn't mean that in a, in a negative tone, but we need to clean up ourselves both with our turnout gear, which contains the toxins that we protect ourselves from, um, stays in our gear, and if we don't clean it, now we're looking at cancer. So back to your question in regards to what, what do we do for, for the other one, that the best thing that we can do is, is get, the, like I said, get that conversation started, make them aware of where it is that they can get help through our links that are on our website. Uh, un unfortunately, we can't mandate anything, uh, but we need to lead by example, and I think you're gonna see that in the coming year where we're leading by example on, on those issues. Thank you. I just have one follow-up in terms of the crisis that we've talked about with volunteer firefighters, recruitment, retention. Um, do you have any um, or has there been any analysis conducted to determine whether or not those uh, issues of, uh, you know, uh, higher occurrences of cancer or chronic pain management um, or uh, incidences of suicide, if those are deterrents for uh, your efforts to recruit and retain uh, volunteer firefighters? Most of that has been at discussion level because it's very difficult to extrapolate that data from what data is available from us. For example, a volunteer firefighter that um, commits suicide may not even be, they, they may not even look at the fire service as part of it because they worked at a factory and they did other things. They may not even be looking at, so is our data even correct? Is it close to being correct? And I, I don't have the answer to that. So um, what we are trying to do is set up some method that we can actually get a little bit more accurate data so that we can address that in, in the manner of which you speak. And are there efforts being made to uh, introduce or pilot some studies to get some data? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I don't say that that's not won't be on the table. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sarah Collette. Uh, Sarah Hughes. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, just a couple uh, follow-ups, and thank you for all your service, your service to the Commonwealth. Um, one of the things that's becoming more obvious as we go through the years and try to manage our finances under difficult circumstances is budgeting becomes a lot harder to follow. Um, which is arguably less, uh, potentially less transparent for the average person who's trying to figure out how much money we're spending. Um, bigger numbers in your agency tend to be in the uh, disaster relief, emergency uh, assistance compact, those types of numbers. Um, the appropriations don't really tie to what's available. You know, money's just moved forward from, from prior years. Uh, money that's appropriate in a certain year, there's money left over in accounts that is not spent. Um, one of the, like in the de disaster relief line, there was a beginning balance adjustment of $5,500,000. It was brought forward of unspent dollars from prior years into 1819. Um, not sure how much of that is spent. Can you give us a, an accounting now, or maybe as a follow up, as a in these lines that relate to those core functions, how much money is still available to spend? Because if you look at this, an average person looks at disaster relief, right? It says, look, it looks like, well, we have no money available for disaster relief this year to spend, at least what's being proposed by the governor. That's not accurate. Senator, we can certainly give you the exact number, but in generalities, and actually John and I have worked on this a lot over the years, uh, the 5.5 million you're looking at is the 20%, 25% match for the the uh, disaster that we were just successful in getting from the president. So 60 million dollars is a 25% match. There's a 25% match on that. That's what that money is. That money, those projects sometimes take two and three years to uh, to fulfill. So yeah, that I'm money, not talking. I'm not questioning whether it's necessary. I just want to know how much is there. 
We can tell you exactly how much is there. It's better if we get it together and give it, send it directly to you. Then we can talk about if it's necessary after that, but let's get an accounting first to yep. see what's here. And some of that relates to the other funds as well. Um, some of the more significant, some of the balances in funds that are under the, under the budget for the, um, for Pima are continuing balances without, from a standpoint of cash and receipts, um, are carrying, carrying, carrying 40 consistent numbers. Um, the voluntary company's loan fund, that's under the fire commissioner. Mm -hmm. It's carrying forward at about $43 million, $40 million. The $20 million encumbrance against that is what we can see. Um, if it's a consistent $20 million against that number, um, the question comes about, is it necessary to hold the balance at that, at that number? The, uh, which other one? The uh, 911 fund. Um, obviously, in a conversation about encumbrances and the needs of that money going forward, um, to describe and defend why the balance in the fund continues to be maintained at around $55 million, what we can see at this point in time. Um, it's good to have a handle on what you expect the encumbrance against that n number to be. Um, because as you know, at this point in time, in cash management, we're, we're analyzing the funds that have balances that are being carried that are not encumbered. And it's consistently happening. It's been happening over the last four or five years. Um, so maybe information to come. You don't have to talk about that now. But just so we know, if what I'm seeing in the voluntary volunteer company's loan fund is a consistent application against that money, about $20 million. If we're pretty confident that what is, that's what we need, then I think it's legitimate, reasonable to, to talk about whether we can utilize the additional funds that are in there for other purposes without hurting the purpose of the fund. If you want to respond to that now, you can, but that's, that's what the numbers show us. Sure, a, a couple things uh, on that. Uh, this past year, we did not do as many loans because we were down on staff and uh, we didn't get up to par for what we had done in years past. Um, that, that has been corrected and we're, we're looking at it, that increasing this year. Also, I think something that we really need to consider is one of the recommendations from SR6 is looking at opening that up to career, not just volunteer. Uh, and, and I think something else that we need to look at as a recommendation from SR6 is the amount of money that we loan. Um, what is the estimate of the amount of loans that will be encumbered against those funds for 2019-20? Um, I would, well, we're currently, we have 13 loans for future meetings, uh, approval meetings, and right now we're probably at, uh, I'm going to guess somewhere around uh, 4 million that we've done in the 18 applications so far. Okay, for 1920. Have any any projections as to how many how much that'll be? I I would have to work. I think with we're the, seeing 20 million dollars. Yeah, I, I would have to work with the staff to be a little more accurate on that, sir. If there are legitimate reasons why that would go above 20, you know, if 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 your projections and plans, because obviously the fund has very legitimate purposes. Right. We don't want to cut that off. You know, but if there's, if what your plans are is to utilize $20 million going forward, then maybe the cash flow into that can be, some of that can be repurposed but without affecting what your plans are. That, that has to be made clear here. You know, we're just talking about an unencumbered ending balance where there's no long-term plans to use it. I understand. We can follow up on that. Um, lastly, in the, in the area of um, fire safety, um, there's an issue that's, it's being considered now that we'll have to decide who is, I guess, best, and different states have dealt with it different ways, best equipped to manage the protocol. And that is, right now, Pennsylvania doesn't have any certification licensure for fire, fire um, equipment, um, extinguishers, uh, commercial fire systems, sprinklers. Um, we would like to have a conversation going forward to allow for that to be uh, something that exists in Pennsylvania, for lack of a better phrase, um, because a lot of states have it and we don't. 
Um, the question is we don't want to put into the, a proposal an administrative agency or um, platform without having a clear uh, understanding or sense that that is the best place to put it. You know, obviously the state fire commissioner would be the first that would be considered for that, but if if there is another alternative place where, pe where those in this space are more comfortable, then that's something we'd have to talk about. I agree. I think that warrants further discussion. Uh, there, there are some things that I think that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it, it's already done there from national certifications for certain types of inspectors. Okay, do we, do we need to Pennsylvanialize that? Maybe, maybe not, but I think uh, it warrants further discussion and we need to look at them on, on each level. Um, and again, I'll, I'll go back to my statement about the community risk. That, that's what we want to keep in the back of our minds as we go forward on that. And yes, I'm, I'm willing to take a, a good hard look at that. We've already talked to the pay fed folks. Um, can we help with the certification? Yes, but we need to get um, a, a clear direction on what type of certification that they want. The main target is to have certain have standards in the field that people are complying with and not have a situation where the, those are selling or servicing these products that have no uh, qualification whatsoever. Absolutely. You know, like any licensing certification standard is. That's the goal. Yep. Not to replicate something that already exists. Yep. And I, I agree. There's probably some avenues like the licensing side probably needs to go somewhere else rather than, than through us. Okay. All right. But well, the certification side, we can help with. That's, a, that's an important piece of it. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Really appreciate your time today. All right. We will convene again tomorrow. We will start tomorrow at 10 o'clock with a depart on oh, Monday. The snow, the snow, the snow got me all messed up. <laughs> what four inches of snow could do to you, you know? Uh, Monday with the Department of Labor and Industry at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>